to reopen the Washington Unified School District uh, regular Board of Education meeting for December 10th, 2015. Um, I will report out on closed session items. Uh, we are going to be returning back into closed session. We um, came out to accommodate under communications and celebrations, even though I don't get to watch my son play basketball tonight, but we'll let Mr. Roberts go play his game. We'd like to um, talk about the celebration under K-1, Austin Roberts, River City High School student, full baseball scholarship to the California State University of Sacramento, Superintendent Luna. The microphone on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> School districts are always so very proud of our students as they move on to uh, college, and especially when um, they are awarded scholarships because of their skills and gifts. And um, we're very proud of you, Austin. Thank you. Congratulations on that. And as your superintendent, and also um, an alumni of Sac State, I, I wanted to leave you a gift. So to get you started on your Sac State track, you've got um, a school banner here, and also you've Can got I to have a sweatshirt. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Oh. So um, <coughs> congratulations Thank you very to much. you, and um, best wishes to Thank you. And you we expect much. to see you playing maybe for the Rivercats soon. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe the board would like to make some comments. I think we have some board comments for you. Um, I'd just like to say I'm an alumni of Sac State, my husband is an alumni, my mom, and now both kids go there. So you're going to have so much fun there. So congratulations. Uh, it's a great job. And the, the, a woman I went to high school with also got a softball scholarship there, and now she's associate vice president of Sac State. So we have high expectations for you. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say we're all very proud of you. Thank you. Ms. Rosado? Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, Microphone. Is the light on? Oh, hi. There you go. <clears throat> I, I'm a former baseball player myself, and I played at Chico State and Sac City. And uh, I, I got to say, I know exactly how hard it is, how much time it takes. And, and you know, getting good grades and, and still working so hard to be the best that you can be on the field is amazing. And you're just, you, you, you know, you make us all very proud to to see you getting the scholarship. So I went to a school that didn't offer them, so it was not so much uh, uh, an award for me. So <laughs> congratulations. Thank you very much. Board member Kirby Gonzalez. Like Katie, I also, or board member Vegas, I also <coughs> am a very proud graduate of um, Sac State. My mom is actually teaching there right now. Maybe you'll have one of her classes. So congratulations to you. Um, and you must be so proud and, um, and what a great gift. So. Can't wait to hopefully come out to a game. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Now, what can I say? I was honored to be there when you signed your letter of intent. And um, to see you with your, your, your former coaches, your former um, teammates, how respected you are, and seeing you around campus and actually watching you grow up, you are a very respectful young man. Thank and you, you made River City proud. And it's, it's a great honor that you'll be going on the Sac State and um, representing us. So congratulations. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for uh, letting me come here and uh, have this opportunity. And I uh, hope I can honor Sacramento as best as I can. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck tonight. Thank you. Okay, I think with that, we're going to go back into closed session. <laughs> Just show 
I'd like to reconvene the open session of uh, Washington Unified School District Regular Board of Education meeting for December 10th, 2015. If I can ask Ms. Peachin to lead us in her last Pledge of Allegiance with us. Announcements of items of action taken in closed session. Uh, government Code Section 54957.6, Conference with Labor Negotiators, Informations rec Information Received. E2, Government Code Section 54956.9, D2, Information Was Received. E3, Government Code Section 54957, Employee Discipline Dismissal Release, Information Was Received and E4, Government Code Section 54957, Superintendent Evaluation and Assessment uh, information was received. I need to get a motion, approval of the agenda. Um, I'd like to pull item 015 for discussion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 015 is pulled. Any any other request? Can I get a motion to approve the agenda with that modification? So moved. Is there Toby, you second? second? All those in favor say aye. 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 We are to the Board of Governance, uh, J1, 2016 Annual Reorganization of the Washington Unified School District Board of Education Officers. Um, every year we um, reorganize our board and at this time I'll turn it over to uh, Superintendent Luna. Good evening President Cruz, Board of Trustees and guests. Uh, this evening the board um, will be going through the annual organization meeting and in this particular meeting, the board shall um, enter into discussion and make a motion to elect a president and a clerk among its members based on <coughs> Education Code 35022 and 35143. Um, at this time, before the board enters into discussion, I'd like to take this moment as your superintendent to um, thank um, President Cruz for her year as president and um, in my six months here, I want to thank you for choosing me and, and your confidence in me as your superintendent. I'm, I'm the one that's been fortunate and very lucky. So thank you very much for your work and your dedication as president of the Board of Trustees of Washington Unified School District for the year 2015. So at this time, the board will enter uh, into discussion and um, choose a new president for the year 2016, a new vice president, and a clerk. Can we open nominations? Be, well, before we have the nominations, I just want to, um, was there any comments or questions or anything about our year together? Um, I think, I just want to say as president, it, it's been a very adventurous, exciting year. Lots of things have happened in Washington Unified. Um, it's been a privilege for you guys to uh, trust me and uh, let me um, kind of guide us a little bit. And um, I enjoyed the governance we have been trying to put together for this year. And um, I just want to thank you. I think we have a great board and I think um, moving forward next year, we got a lot of good things coming. So I just want to thank you guys and uh, actually wish you all a happy holiday. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for entrusting me to be one of your, uh, one of your fellow trustees. Um, it's been a whirlwind of information that I've had to you know, re read through and kind of figure out how to navigate through. Um, but I do enjoy the camaraderie that this board has and I, I really 
appreciate your trust in me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I just want to give a shout out to Alicia, who's done an excellent job. You know, that's a hard job to do, and w with not a lot of training, and you went out and got you you researched and and you got a lot of um, training on your own, and you worked. I don't know anybody on this board that works harder than she does um, to be in the position. So I just really want to thank you for all the extra hours and all the extra time and your professionalism and um, and your ability to run a meeting. I've been quite impressed. So thank you for that. Oh. I just want to thank all three of you. You've done a fantastic job. And um, I, th I think, quite honestly, it should be uh, two-year, you know, terms that we have. Okay. Um, it has been, we have done so much this past year. I don't think uh, much of which we could have never planned or anticipated. A uh, new uh, superintendent we are so happy to have. Um, we had an appointment. This has been just a very busy year. A lot of work behind the scenes, um, a lot of high stress work behind the scenes. And Board President Cruz handled it so well um, with the community members, with things that needed to happen, and so appreciate all that you have done there. I know when you came to this place of, of um, Board President, you had ideas and goals and places that we were going to go together. And I, a lot of that's happened. We've done a lot of good things. We have a good cohesive um, board. A lot of that's happened. But at the same time, our superintendent came on in the summer, and there's a lot of things I know that you still want to do that, haven't, that you haven't had time to do yet um, because it has been a time of transition. And so um, I would make a um, unprecedented motion, and I would make one now, um, that we would keep Board President Cruz on for another year. So I would make a motion to have um, President Cruz nominated uh, to be president. I'll second. I'll second. We'll yeah. second. We'll second. <laughs> I decline. No, I <laughs> no, you don't. You're not allowed. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, and I do look forward. Sarah's absolutely right. Um, there's, there were some things I would like to do, but uh, time, you know, other, other things became priorities for our district. And um, I, I would like to say working on this board, a lot, we're, we're really together. I mean, if you come to the meetings, um, we're pretty all on spot. And, you know, that's really due to the administrative staff giving us the information we need to make those choices. And so I, I really thank you guys for um, giving me that chance one more time. So do we need to make a formal motion? Okay. Um, is make it, a formal motion. Is I it a roll call vote or just? Unanimous. Okay. okay. All, in, all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next we have um, the vice president role. I'd like to nominate Sarah Kirby Gonzalez again. I'll second I second it. it. Wow, this is going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Thank you. I would Are you gladly. Willing, Absolutely. Right. It's an honor. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And then we have clerk. And I'd like to nominate Katie Vegas again. Oh, you know. I don't get <laughs> Really? Second. You did so I will be, and it's a lot to sign papers with Scott, but I don't have to be. But if anybody wants it, that's fine. But thanks. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Do we have a... A roll call vote or a, a motion to uh, approve Katie as our clerk again? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that was right, easy. Okay. And usually we have our secretary appointed as the uh, superintendent. Does anybody object to that? <laughs> so we'll appoint uh, uh, Linda Luna as our um, secretary. Okay. So along with that, each year we also go through all of our subcommittees. And over the fa past few years, it's kind of, I don't want to say be a free for all. I know we all have different schedules. And so um, we've kind of just all stated our interest in the board. So I'm going to go through them one by one. Um, I will um, talk about which ones they are. Um, I think this year, and I'll have to defer to uh, Superintendent Luna, did we get the information on the delegate assembly? Is there an opening? Um, I apologize. I did not get confirmation um, about um, our particular delegate uh, position. It does state that it uh, it ends 2016. 
So whether that's in the beginning for the election or at the end in November, um, I'm looking at the elections here for CSBA. The elections are actually going to be held in the spring um, from, from nominations here. So what I would um, suggest, if I may, that the board would go ahead and walk through that for any board that might be interested in serving on CSBA delegate assembly to go ahead and take motion and then we will uh, confirm um, the timing on that for our particular region. Okay. Yeah, and last year I made a spiel because it's they're right here in West Sacramento and there's nobody mm -hmm. from West, West Sacramento on that board, so. Is it Bill, o Bill Owens from, is that Bill Owens, is that the name? From, from Davis, um, isn't it? Yeah, probably. I thought, and it's Susan, a woman. Susan oh, it's Lovember. a, it's a woman. Okay. Cause, Susan yeah, because I think she asked for our nomination. blessing nomination, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so I'm going to go through um, these one by one. Maybe I don't have my glasses on. Are they listed? <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not seeing them listed. I, I know them. What we have is the two by two, which we have two board members. We have the Up for West Sac committee, and we've always had one, but I want to go ahead and have one, and um, we've always said uh, an alternate or a backup, and I want to definitely put that out tonight. So because last year it was, we kind of didn't know if we had one and we did, but I'm gonna make that quite clear. And then we have the Yolo County Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And we have, and that's usually one, and I don't know if we wanna talk about having a backup, but the two that have served it the last few years seem to have had that under control. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Curriculum Council in which we usually have two board members. So, um, if the board doesn't mind, um, I think I'd like to start with Mr. Pizzotti since he's new and see what his interests might be. <clears throat> well, let's see. I definitely have an interest in the Up for West SAC and the 2x2. Two two. Those are kind of my interests, but I would say primarily Up for West SAC would be okay. number one. Awesome. Is there... Um, interest uh, by any other board members for up for West Sac to be alternate or I'm also very interested in that because I currently um, have been pushing for the universal preschool and can we have two board members attend those meetings mm -hmm. I'm unaware of their guidelines but I, I would <coughs> I, I'm not quite sure if they have a set number of committee members, okay. so. I don't think we vote, right? Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if we can check that. Board, so you should check. Yeah, if we can check into that, and uh, we can have two. Okay. Is there, I know everybody's gonna jump at this one. Is there any takers for the Yolo County Board of Education? Me. Yay. Yay. Oh, oh, okay. Hey. It, it's it's been great, you it's know. We've, uh, we actually passed passed the resolution to make certain that uh, you know all our high school seniors in all the high schools, you know, would be registered to vote, and that was something very positive. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and I know Sarah and I have served on, served on the curriculum council. Is um, Sarah, do you still have an interest in that? Or? I'm happy to do that. I'm working on. Um, babysitters to be lined up <laughs> so that makes that a little easier I apologize to everyone who was at the last one with my children but <laughs> um, yes curriculum is near and dear to my heart I'm happy to stay on that one Katie do you have an interest that we have two by two in the um, curriculum I'd like to be on the two by two yeah and I I also have in um, like the two by two I feel like it feels like we just got there mm -hmm. um, in terms of momentum and, and work to be done. Is the board okay with that? Okay. Wait, did you just put one down? So, yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I would say since I'm the newest on the board, you can all, <laughs> Maybe in you my opinion, you can all just go ahead and bump me out <laughs> where we well, can. If one, Do you if, have an alternate? If, yeah, if we can't, if mm -hmm. they can't make oh, it, that you know, right. they definitely can email. Well, it's Norma. Katie, Sarah, 
that we already have that have interest in the two by two, right? Oh, we, no, no, I have no interest. Just in oh, you don't. Just okay, Katie. okay. <laughs> just Katie not in a bad Sarah. way. Okay, Katie and Sarah. Then yes, yeah. I did have an interest. So, in so that. yeah, it's good to have backups because you know I really like. I, I don't. I'm not really sure if we, as a board, missed any of our subcommittee meetings. It seemed like they're pretty well covered, mm -hmm. but you know things happen. So it's nice that we can talk about having backups. And I think it's important to acknowledge too um, that. Mr. Pizzotti has a preschooler, which is exciting. So right. I think you two will make a great team because it's good. we all love that preschool commission. That's a good one. So right. I think that that will be a good voice and you'll be a good team together. And I, I think I'll go ahead and stay on the curriculum with Sarah. I enjoy seeing all the new things coming out. And is there an interest from anyone on the board of, on the uh, CSB delegate assembly? We talked about that one last time. Mm -hmm. um, and I would certainly be interested. I know you were interested last time, and I would be happy to nominate you again if that's something that you'd be interested in, or you, you could nominate you yourself. I think we have to vote on this. Well, I would love to do it. Um, if you would love to do it, I'm <laughs> fine with that too. <laughs> we're too nice. Well, that's what we did last time. Last, well, last time, time, we last did time it I was the backup, backup as we researched right. it. And unfortunately, and last it didn't time, work, so well, what happened? You apparently, there wasn't a seat. Even though it exactly. wasn't announced. So we went so. through the whole process, and but then there wasn't again. a place for you. So that's why I'm it saying. It may end up that way again if there's no seat. So, Have we ever had a delegate from West Sac? Does anyone know? Yeah, Mary, Mary's been Mary, Mary, Yeah, Mary yeah. was. So we need a motion, I guess, to uh, elect me to be our... Would you like to do it? I will try with a backup. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll make a motion to approve. Um, Second. President Cruz. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. All right. So we are returning now to communications and celebrations. Did uh, Pam, you got all that? Thank you. We um, already celebrated Mr. Roberts, K1. So we'll go to K2, the Farm to Fork presentation by the River City High School students, um, Jennifer McAllister. You're right. Um, <clears throat> good evening, President Cruz, and congratulations on a second term, um, members of the board and uh, Superintendent Luna. You might remember a sneak preview uh, at the last board meeting of our Farm to Fork uh, students. and. Um, so we brought uh, Jennifer McAllister, our magnificent Farm to Fork teacher, and her magnif magnificent students to share a little bit with you. And we're calling it a celebration because there's a lot to celebrate. Um, I was able to see this in action a few days ago and, and get the full treatment from the students. And so we have a little bit of a presentation from them and some visuals. So if you could cue that up, Pam, thanks. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. And uh, before I start, um, Alicia and um, uh, Mr. Spaulding, thank you so much, the two of you, for being at Claire Wiley's building naming ceremony on Friday. That meant a lot to me. So um, thank you very much. I didn't get a chance to come talk to you, but thank you very much. Um, I also want to say thank you. I I'm going to my 20th year of teaching here. Wow. Pam. Congratulations. The great, I know. It's crazy. And so I, I want to say thank you. I feel so grateful to be here. I love working for this district. I love the opportunities. I love working with the students. And this program that we have, it's working and it, it makes me feel good. And we're making good things happen for students and opportunities. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to turn it over to my officers. Okay, um, hi, my name is Quincy. I'm the Farm to Fork president. Um, I met a couple of you. Um, to me, Farm to Fork is about educating people to live healthy and sustainable lives. Some of the crops we are growing in our garden are snow peas, beets, radishes, potatoes, and broccoli. We also have a variety of spring crops growing in our greenhouse. One project the Farm to Fork class participated in was pumpkin pie making. It was special because we used pumpkins straight from the garden and made everything from scratch. We also had help from the owner of Vince's restaurant who offered us a um, potential job. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, another project the Farm to Fork class participated in was the Farm to Fork Festival. At the festival, we picked up trash and educated people about the Farm to Fork movement. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Emiliano and Emiliano Rosas, and I'm the secretary for Farm to Fork. And my experience with Farm to Fork was is amazing. Um, I get to meet a couple of you guys, Elise, President Cruz. You're amazing. You're fantastic. Also, um, Sarah Kirby Gonzalez and Katie Viegas. Um, the Harvest Festival. It was amazing. The food. Come on, who doesn't love food and laughter? <laughs> um, yeah, the new Bright Campus is amazing. And I would like to welcome our new, you know, councilman. I mean, board <laughs> member. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, Next step. <laughs> yeah, but my time here in Farm to Fork is amazing. Um, our president is amazing. She does so much for us, and also our treasurer is amazing. I would like to thank you guys. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. You're amazing. <laughs> You're amazing. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Valeria Velarde, and I'm the Farm to Fork treasurer. Farm to Fork is a great program in which students can learn skills they wouldn't learn in a regular classroom, skills that they can be useful for future jobs. I've noticed that most students work harder in the garden than in the classroom. Farm to Fork started as a comment that we should have a garden in the school. We also have support from Jason Billington, who built our garden beds, and our sponsors, Rayleigh's and Rangeland Trust. At the Harvest Festival, I met Shane Serlian. He's a worker worker from Fury Ginger Farms at the urban farm behind Yolo High School. Our next field trip will be to one of their farms on January 7th. He visited our classroom and suggested pest control and permaculture because uh, we had caterpillars and aphids eating our crops. <laughs> <laughs> I am grateful that you guys, the school members, are supporting Farm to Fork because we're just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you have some comments? I do. Uh, I had a lovely tour of the garden, and um, I think there's a lot we can do with that garden. I think there's a lot of folks in the community that would, would love to support that, and uh, one of the first things that I'm hoping we can get to with them is uh, fruit trees and more land expansion out there. Um, I think they have a lot of area out there that, that could be used for that. And um, the kids are pretty excited about that. When I took a tour of the garden, they know way more. I've been gardening for years. <laughs> but they knew way more than I did. And uh, it was evident that, that they're learning a ton. And they're incredibly enthusiastic. And I'd like to do whatever we can, um, whether it's get sponsors outside in the community or um, or have the school district fork over some land and money to support the project because I just think it's that cool. It's really good. And there's a bigger movement going on. The bridge dinner is here in West Sacramento and we have the urban farm stands that you're going to tour soon. And those folks are new farmers. They're not that much older than you guys learning how to farm property in West Sacramento and uh, through the Land Based Learning Center. And she is very supportive of, of what you're doing and super excited that, that this is going on there as well. Mary Kimball is the executive director of that. So congratulations, and we look, look forward to doing more with you. Thank you. Any, any more comments? Um, I was talking with Barbara Archer, who is a trustee in Davis, and she belongs to, I believe, one of the local co-ops. Mm -hmm. And she wants to um, invite all the students of the Culinary Academy. So this is another great opportunity to also reach out you know, to our other districts in Yolo County. She's actually um, Farm Fresh to You, which mm -hmm. is the home delivery um, market. And she, mm -hmm. it's located, their warehouse is actually located here in West Sac. Mm -hmm. So they, I definitely think, and she's a school board member oh, in right, Davis right, as uh -huh. well. So 
and, and good contact. One of our teachers at Stonegate uses her. She dr they drop off food and yeah, and, and um, but the students get to try new food that they haven't experienced. And yeah. so good resource mm -hmm. and good for um, all of you. And I apologize, we came out late, and I know you had a long day. Your teacher long day at work, students long day at school, and so um, thank you for for being here tonight and giving up your evening to come here. Um, and the depth of work that you're doing at the garden is so, it, the knowledge that the students know, it really is incredible and it's special. And it's true, when we go and we see our colleagues and we collaborate with others, uh, we talk about you and we tell them what we're doing. <laughs> we say, come here and we say to our superintendent, CSBA needs some more workshops. We have lots and lots of folks that could do a good uh, presentation and that it could be one that you could share what we're doing in the region and how really you've become a leader. and. Um, in that and so thank you for all of that and um, and also I, the sustainability piece too it, this and the students were so focused on their carbon footprint and how are they making a difference in the world and so really you're cultivating good citizens too who are going to go out and be responsible um, folks and and already are making a difference so thank you for all that you do and thank you for giving up um, your evening tonight to share even more and I just want to echo everybody else's comments, but uh, I was with uh, Board Memo Al Al Alcala when we were talking to Barbara Archer, <laughs> and she, you know, I'm the new guy, so I haven't been able to get out and see everything so far yet, but you know, Norma was basically boasting at how wonderful this program is to, to the other, uh, you know, to the other lady there, and I think it's, you know, a testament to your hard work and, and everything that you guys do, so thank you. And it, I love the festival. I love seeing you there. Um, you know, if you ever get a chance to see these kids in action, they're smiling. And if you just ask those few magic words, what is Farm to Fresh? They all will tell you. They, they very, they're, and they're just so happy to tell you. You know, it, we're so lucky to have this program. And I'm always so excited to see, they're just always so pleasant and, they're, and very knowledgeable and very approachable. Um, I, I wanted to let you know, I, I attended an orientation last night um, because I have nothing else to do. <laughs> and um, I was just accepted as a chef in a program that is being beta, beta tested this month and it will be live in January. And they have three aspects to their program. And one is home cooks, one is food trucks, and the third is farm to fork. So we're going in the right direction. And so I'm excited um, to even bring, and, and that's just in the Sacramento area, so it's going to go live. So I'm excited to um, talk to you about that program. But thank you very much for coming out. I enjoy seeing you, and I hope to continue see, seeing you. Thank you very much. We have K3, our Youth Fire Academy, the Fire Chief John Hillman from West Sacramento Fire Department. How does this go? <laughs> Evening, President Cruz and members of the board. Uh, my name is John Heilman. I'm the uh, City of West Sacramento Fire Chief. And uh, about a month and a half ago, I met with Superintendent Luna and was explaining to her the, the City of West Sacramento Youth Fire Academy that we're starting in the fire department. She asked that I come and give a brief informational presentation to you on the program. So you can go ahead and start the PowerPoint. You don't have the PowerPoint. <laughs> <coughs> I have it on a memory stick because, <laughs> because I'm prepared. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm prepared. I can go ahead and get started anyway. The, uh, when I was hired here, it was identified that, um, as the fire chief, it was identified that there was not a program for the youth to be educated on uh, opportunities in the fire service and to becoming firefighters. So um, uh, I was raised in a, in a program that we're kind of mirroring here. Uh, this is how I got my start and how a lot of the firefighters in the city of West Sacramento got their starts also. 
The fire service is a very unique industry. Um, you know, most of the firefighters that you see out there have a mother or father, brother, sister, or cousin, close friend that's in the service that educates them on how to obtain the career and how to become a viable candidate to become a firefighter, um, and then how to navigate their careers. And without that, it's very difficult because it's very competitive. So that's what this program is all about. It's about taking local youth and uh, giving them the opportunity to see what it is to go through a hiring process through a fire academy and then into life in the firehouse working 48 hour shifts and so forth because it is a different lifestyle. So the objectives are to educate local youth about career opportunities in the fire service, prepare cadets with the educational path and expectations to become a viable firefighter candidate, provide instruction and information on basics of firefighting and first aid procedures, allow for a ride-along program exposing cadets to life in the firehouse and providing an opportunity for 24 hours of community service applicable toward graduation. So we're basically taking what's, what's six to eight years of a firefighter's career and we're condensing that down into about two months and giving them a quick, uh, a brief overview. Like the academy, that we're, the actual hands-on firefighter hose and ladders academy is only gonna be one week long and usually it's about 18 weeks and so forth. Adjusting to life in the firehouse takes years, but we're going to give that to them <laughs> 24 hours. But it, it'll, it will actually give them a, 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 they'll know when they leave this program if it's something they want to pursue. So the program overview, we're hoping to get uh, 40 potential candidates. Of those, we'd like to se select 20 between the ages of 15 and 18 for class number one. We are uh, budgeted for one class in 2016 and two classes in 2017. Um, it is of no cost to the student. This comes out of the fire department budget, um, and so it's, it's uh, uh, open to anyone. Um, the, uh, after we select those first 20, uh, uh, before I go there, we uh, open the applications. We had six applicants in like the first day and a half, so uh, I think we're going to fill it up. If it doesn't fill up, I'm still going to run the class because I think through word of mouth after the first one, it will take off. Um, after we select them, they'll go into their classroom sessions, and in the classroom, they'll get, uh, they'll start with the hiring process. They'll take a, a sample civil service exam, so they'll know where they need to work on things to be competitive in the written examination. Then they'll take a state physical fitness agility test, which is basically what they need to take for the state. So if they're not successful, they'll know they need to work on their strength or whatever the case may be. Um, then we go into simulated oral boards. Um, if you've never been in an oral board, I remember my first oral board. It was a, a pretty terrifying experience, so we'll give them practice and teach them how to navigate an oral board. Um, after that, we go into a basic first aid and CPR, and then basic uh, classroom firefighting techniques. Once they're successful in the classroom, we proceed to the, the training ground. Now, the training ground is uh, a week-long, eight-hour days at the City of West Sacramento Fire Training Facility, which is out at the Port of West Sacramento. And in, that, in the training in the academy, uh, we start with the basics of firefighting, hoses and ladders, which everybody knows. But then we get into the more of the intangibles, the physical fitness, the grooming standards, uh, attitude, teamwork, ethics. Uh, ethics is a big one. Um, I have friends of mine who were not successful in the service because of poor choices they had made, uh, you know, in high school or in college. And so um, we want to educate the youth that, you know, the decisions that they're making now are actually going to affect their future opportunities. So we talk a lot about ethics in the academy. The next step after um, successful completion of the hands-on academy, uh, the week-long hands-on academy, they will graduate from the program, we'll have a graduation ceremony, and at the ceremony they'll be signed, assigned to a station and a shift captain, which is basically what happens when you do graduate from the full academy. They, they assign you to a station and a shift, and um, they'll perform three three-hour uh, shifts at the station, then one eight-hour weekend shift where they'll spend eight hours with the company. Um, this is an open book. I mean, you know, if, if a student uh, is, is passionate about it and wants to continue, you know, I, I'd be happy to support them and continue as long as they want. Uh, hopefully they'll develop a mentor in the program, somebody that can help them if they decide that this is something that they want to pursue as a career. Um, you know, it, this is a copy. We've been to the, uh, we've been to River City High School a few days. We've handed out flyers. We've been uh, handed out flyers at uh, Yolo uh, High School. We um, uh, 
have been all over the internet. You know, we're marketing this because uh, we think it's going to be a very positive, uh, have a very positive effect on local youth that are interested in the fire service. This is a copy of the uh, informational flyer that we've been handing out at the schools and talking to the students about. You know, our, our goal is to have uh, one day uh, a firefighter get hired and say that they got their start in the City of West Sacramento Youth Fire Academy. So uh, I'd be happy to field any questions that you have about the academy. Do we have questions or just great comments? Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> no. um, right? I think this is an awesome idea. Is it my turn, Lucha? Sure. <laughs> um, I think this is a great idea. As someone who was in the criminal justice field, I went through the, the community service academy and had to drag bodies and, and you know do target practice and whatnot. So I think this is an awesome. The folks that I know that went into firefighting had family in firefight and they were firefighters. So I think this really opens up great doors and opportunities for the kids of West Hack, and I think that's awesome. Is there an age limit on the? We're, we're looking at 15 to 18. You know, this is our first go at this one. So, um, you know, we're going to make the adjustments that we need to make, depending on how many applicants we get. You know, we'll, we'll make the adjustments from there. If we need to widen the range, we'll widen the range. But I think 15 to 18 is usually about the maturity level that you want for the program. But we'll see how it goes. Ex I'm excited. So. Thanks. Board Member Pizzotti. Yeah, I, I used to represent a state employee group of firefighters, and I think this is an outstanding opportunity to, to get some of the kids' feet wet and get them introduced into what could be a wonderful career and a you know, very fulfilling career in the fire services. So I, I, I commend you on your efforts. This is a great program. I appreciate that. Thank you. Board Member Alcott? I just want to say thank you also, Chief, because we've often talked about partnerships with, um, you know, different entities within West Sacramento, and this is affording an opportunity um, for quite an elite job, you know, and I, I was just going to ask, have you had any females apply? Uh, yeah, we had one phone call from one female, um, and I don't know the gender of the other six mm -hmm. applicants, but it, this is not exclusive to anybody. I mean, we want a, we want a diverse group. Right. You know, but we want to try and keep it as local youth as we can. Um, we'll expand it if we have to, but um, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for diversity, and uh, you know, because that's what the firefighters all—that's what the fire department's all about. Yeah. That's what we're trying to promote. So this is fantastic. Yeah. The mentoring and, and preparing them, and and we're going to have some of our own homegrown here. I so, hope so. Awesome. That's the plan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Board Member Kirby Gonzalez. We think alike. I wrote women, question mark. <laughs> so the, the, the uh, firefighter that's actually, uh, I, I put on this project when we first thought of it, is um, uh, a female firefighter who's very passionate, and she, she understands where we're trying to take the program. So I think we wanted to show that there is diversity in the fire department. We didn't want to show just, you know, males. So that's Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. This absolutely. is a... As everyone said, this is a great opportunity. I saw you speak at a council meeting, and I thought, I want to hear that presentation, so I'm so glad that you're here. Good. And uh, whatever we can do to support you and help get the word out, I have no doubt that you'll fill this class, um, but we can certainly help and, and make sure that we get the word out as well. Uh, is this a model that, um, in terms of the way you're doing the course outline and things like that that you've seen in other places that's replicated, or is this something that your team has designed I'm just this about this that is kind of a, a, a morph of a lot of different models. Okay. You know, uh, the, the model that I first, you know, you know, I was sitting in a speech class and my friend said, hey, let's go be firefighters. I went, eh, that sounds great. And the next <laughs> thing I knew, you know, I went to my first drill and I was going, I found it. This is great. And that's what we're hoping that some of the students here find. Mm -hmm. um, and I stuck with it. Uh, but we took that model and then a few of the other models that other people have been in, we kind of morphed them for what you can do. You know, in those days, in the you know, mid-80s, the, the liability factor wasn't such a big issue, so you have to be a little more careful now. But, but uh, we think it'll be a, a, an exciting and a good program. So that's Absolutely. What we're thank you. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. And thank you also for um, bringing up the ethics piece of it, because whatever we can do to convince our students not to go down a bad <laughs> track we want to do it but of course I think so often kids don't know that they don't know you make one bad choice here and it can affect your career uh, my husband's a police officer they have the same thing as you know and, and the kids don't always hear that or know and, and the more deterrence we give them the better and so um, I, I think that's a really important message for them too and I'm glad you brought it up but thank you thank you for all you Absolutely. do thanks thanks what can I say I'm excited thank you thank you thank your fellow officers 
Um, this is a great opportunity for our students. I remember my son probably, uh, he was very young, but he was on the front page of the news ledger um, when you had like a one day thing here at the rec center and he was pulling the hose and, but he had a great smile on his face. Right. So I'm glad to see that um, w the program's coming back and we can offer this. Um, and when you talk about putting it out there, the only way you can get to the kids is social media, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you know <laughs> or put it in a, 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 a Nintendo game. Yeah, you, yeah that's, well, we, we're all over the social media. And, but I'm, uh, sure, I'm, I'm sure we'll <laughs> fill it up quickly. And I, I want to make sure that um, when graduation comes around that we all get invitations. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure we will yeah, be there. Yeah, absolutely. No, and that'll be an lots exciting of day for everybody. We're, we love pictures. And uh, any time we can come out and actually maybe observe, that would be great. But very exciting, and thank you so much. Really do appreciate it. Wait, are thank we you. too old for the Academy? <laughs> I um, wasn't going to ask. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> uh, the fire department doors are always open. Uh. We want to keep it a, a very, it's a, it's a public entity, and we want to keep it that way. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. All right. We are to celebration item, Wells Fargo Foundation, $1,000 donation to River City High School. Linda. Good evening, everyone. Oops. Oh, wait a minute. We're it's Linda. The Wells Fargo Foundation $1,000 donation to River City High School. Wells Fargo's good. <laughs> Stan, come on up. <laughs> good evening. Uh, River City High School. On behalf of River City High School, I'm Stan Moisich. I'm the principal of River City High School, and I'd like to um, thank Wells Fargo for once again contributing um, to our school program. So this year they've given us $1,000. Um, to help our schools. Thank is, you. Is it specific for a program or is it just a donation to it the was high a, school? It was a general donation to River okay. City High School. Huh? Great. Very, Very nice. nice. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, student report. I know you're anxious. <laughs> Sorry, I was so <laughs> That's excited. That's okay. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I have a couple exciting reports from a few of our schools. Thank you. On behalf of Southport Elementary. Good evening and happy holidays from Southport. Last week, Southport had a scholastic book fair and on Thursday we had our very first winter craft fair. The craft fair was a fundraiser for our eighth grade students to go on a field trip to Washington DC in June. The fair was a huge success and they raised almost $2,000. We recently had our business day for all of our fourth graders. Each student chose a career, researched that career, dressed the part, and recited oral presentations for visiting classes and parents. The cafeteria was packed and buzzing with future entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and superintendents. It was an exciting time. On Saturday, January 9th, Southport will host our annual Rose Pruning Clinic for the public. This free clinic is run by TJ David, who is co-creator of the World Peace Rose Gardens located all over the world. The clinic will run from 10.30 to 12 and everyone is welcome. Please mark your calendars for January 9th at 10.30. Refreshments will be served. Southport wishes you all the best during this holiday season and a wonderful new year. At River City High School, please help us to celebrate the holiday season by joining the RCH choirs, jazz band, and orchestra as we perform a selection of holiday songs. There will be an audience sing-along at the end and hot cocoa and cookies will be, be available. The performance will be at 7 p.m. in the River City Cafe. Tickets will be $4 at the door. And a huge thank you goes out to board member Katie Villegas for helping the music department acquire an extra piano. We are extremely thankful. All s <laughs> it was, it was, it was not oh. <laughs> well, thank you anyways. Okay. Also tomorrow is the holiday movie night hosted by the freshman leadership class. The Polar Express will be playing from 5 to 7 p.m. and the Grinch will be playing from 7.45 until 9.15. This event will be at River City in H Commons and is open to the entire community. It is $2 per person and will be loads of fun for the entire family. I encourage everyone to come out to the movie night, the holiday performance, or maybe even both to support a few of the great programs we have at River City. I am excited to announce that this year, the River City High School Band will be joined by the Bridgeway and Stonegate Bands for a holiday concert. This concert will be at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, December 15th in the River City High School Gym. Admission is free with a suggested $5 donation at the door. Come out and enjoy a night of winter band music. We hope to see you there. 
And a friend, friendly reminder that if you would like to support the rugby team, you can purchase a pancake bre breakfast ticket for $7. The breakfast is, is December 27th at 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. and is hosted by our local VFW. With each ticket purchase, you are also entered into the free drawing at the door. In addition, rugby apparel is available for purchase <coughs> for anyone interested. All information for the apparel is available on the River City High School Facebook page. That's all I have for this evening, but on behalf of River City and the numerous other schools in our district, I want to wish everyone a great holiday season and a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. What kind of apparel do you guys have? The rugby apparel? Sorry. We have a few t-shirts and then they're all rugby, um, River City rugby themed. So all of the pictures are online on the Facebook. It's on Facebook. Okay. They're all like going to be blue and yellow. It's on Facebook. Mm -hmm. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? They're actually very nice looking. Yeah. yeah really nice. And can I just add one other thing? The piano that we had donated was actually donated to the Children's Alliance um, from a former teacher in Davis, and it was very sweet. But the, oh, I have another piano coming to you hopefully on the 18th. But I'd just like to encourage folks if they have extra instruments or, or – um, you know, musical type things. Um, it was very well needed, and, and the choir teacher was so appreciative. It, it was, thank you for saying that, but it really wasn't me. I just facilitated it. So if anybody has a line on things like that, you know, if you have something lying around that you don't use anymore, there's a lot of kids that can use that. So. <coughs> I, and I think I mentioned this probably, may, it's probably been a bit about a year ago, but I was working at the, the snack bar there, and a, a, an older gentleman came up with a trombone and uh, I told the kids he couldn't pay his, for his nacho, so he just gave me this trombone, but he donated it to the, the music department. So we accept everything at the Booster Snack Bars. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it's nice to see. Yeah, the piano would be kind of hard. But it, it's just nice to see the community come together and um, donate what, what's needed. So thank you, and have a nice holiday yourself. We are to WTA reports. Good evening. Um, Kobe, just a quick note. I bought one of the rugby uh, hoodies. It's really pretty snazzy looking. I'm not knowing I'm it looking, tonight. I'm trying to find I, it online <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay. Good. Very, good. Very nice good. looking. Um, I'd like to thank the board and the district for honoring one of our teachers, Claire Wiley, who died prematurely last year. As Jennifer McAllister mentioned, there was a ceremony for her last week at the high school and dedication of the science building in her name, and it was nice to see you there, Alicia and, and Bill. Um, and it meant a lot to us, and so very much appreciate it. Everybody else was at CSBA conference, or else they would have been there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the Facebook post. <laughs> um, I was going to, uh, add, tonight, let me see, I have a couple things I wanted to bring up. I, I've been asked quite a bit about uh, what's going on with our Measure V funds. And I'm, I'm hoping we can sometime in the near future have an, uh, an update on where things are and where things are moving. Um, and for instance, the project pipelines, when things should be rolling out and finished. Um, I, the layout on, on this, and the improved safety across the district. And, and then the, the, the one I just got hit with this morning was, what about the new building at the high school? And I, and I know teachers are anxious to become involved in that process. And I know with our expansion of our career tech programs, there's a lot of interest in that. So I'm hoping we can have those conversations or have that report sometime in the, in the near future. Thank you. Um, negotiations. So. Our negotiations team has been working very hard, and, they, and they've always worked very hard. They, all, they come to the meetings very well prepared um, and ready to work. Uh, and, they, and they've taken on these duties in addition to their normal teaching tasks. This is a lot of work, and they don't get paid for it. Um, they've been very disappointed this, this last month. They've had, we've had two bargaining sessions that were canceled at the last minute and they feel very let down by that. And so I'm hoping when we come back in the new year, things can get rolling again. I have to say our negotiations uh, last month of November went very well, and we moved very quickly on a number of items. So I'm hoping we, the, the rest of the process goes that way as well. Um, and uh, 
So as we come to the end of the year, I, you know, I know it's the, that time of the year that we, we tend to reflect and look back on how things have gone on, and so you get to hear some of my two cents worth tonight. Um, I, first, just kind of a general thing. Uh, you know, I know that we have a lot of challenges in this district, but just let me just say it just real uh, succinctly that I think most of them center around communication and, and expectations. So I'm, I know there have been changes in that regard and improvements in that regard. So almost all of them I can all take back to those issues and had things been communicated a little differently, you know, an issue may not have arisen or um, could have been smoothed over much more easily. So I know the district is working on that and I look forward to more of that. But i uh, also like to talk about the really good things that have gone on this year. And you know, we now, here we are at the end of this year with a great new superintendent. And, and it's very obvious to those of us here that you and, and she, all of you, and she are working very well together. Uh, the selection process for the Mary Leland's replacement went very smoothly. And again, obvious from those of us watching the process that it was very transparent and open and very much appreciated. And you as a team very clearly have been working very well together these, this last year and it's much appreciated. And obviously the district and our kids are, are, are bearing the good fruit from that. Um, you know, and some of the things that have happened this year, the Bright Academy, um, it's just been wonderful. Um, very, very happy to go over there and, and tour the kitchen every time I go over there. Um, our emerging farm to fork programs, you know, and this is you know, great for our schools, our kids, and more than that, it's about uh, it, it's how it's, we are building our partnerships with in the community and in, in ways we haven't seen before. I think this is really key. Um, we have a very dedicated and committed and talented staff in this district. Some of them get a little cranky. I'm, I have to put myself in that one. Um, <laughs> and I know I'm amazed when I go around to classrooms and see what my colleagues are up to. It's, it, I'm, I, I'm just blown away. And uh, I might add that I left campus today at 5 p.m. and the parking lot was still full. And, and you need to know that that's the type of commitment you have from the people working here. Um, and of course, lastly, uh, the, our kids. And uh, WESAC is a wonderful place to work, like Jennifer said earlier. And uh, we have great kids for whom we, we serve. And I feel very honored to be here and, and work here. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a uh, wonderful holiday season and look forward to working with you next year. Take care. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. CSEA report, Deborah. Good evening. Um, I want to say uh, congratulations again, once again, Mrs. Cruz uh, and uh, Ms. Gonzalez for having another term uh, at it. Um, also, um, CSEA is having their annual um, holiday party. And once again, we would love to have you guys uh, presence. Uh, it's December 16th uh, at the VFW Hall. I have your invitations. We have such a great time, and um, it's really um, classified. I really like seeing when the board come in, so we really hope that we can see you guys again uh, this year. Other than that, I wish everybody a happy holidays. Um, right now, I'm not feeling very well, so I'm going to just be leaving right after. So happy holidays, and I'm really hoping to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Feel better.
Don forgot something. <laughs> sorry, Becky, I'm so sorry. I should refer to my notes that I actually bring up here with me when I come <laughs> up here. But I wanted to thank you for your years of service here. And, uh, and um, it's been enjoyable working with you at, at this level. And, and uh, good luck in your retirement and in your future. Thank you. <laughs> I have uh, public comments next. I have, looks like Sean, is it Rajabi? Is it Sean? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity that you gave me to be here tonight and talk about our services. Uh, it was my pleasure to meet uh, Norma at the uh, San Diego Convention Center at the California School Board Association. We had a booth out there and we were um, uh, promoting our uh, company. We are a private security company that uh, provides uh, security services to school districts uh, and government agencies. Um, and currently we have three school districts that we provide services to, um, Antioch Unified School District, Aspire School in Oakland, and Clayton Valley Charter School in uh, Clayton and Concord area. So the biggest that we have is the Antioch Unified School District, which is approximately 24 schools that we patrol. So what we do is we replace the SROs, um, full uniformed um, um, security officers armed, which will respond to the calls, school to school, working directly with the school district. And so far, it's been over four years. It's working great for Antioch Unified School Districts. They're extremely happy. And every time I attend to the board meetings, and they always say we will never go back to SROs. Um, and um, our office is also trained through Delta Tactical Training Group, which is um, they have uh, instructors, law enforcement instructors, that, uh, that train these officers um, to be um, school resources officers. And most of our officers either retire police officers or um, uh, graduate police academy. Um, so I wanted to just kind of come out tonight and present that to you guys and provide some uh, more information. Um, and um, if you guys are interested, we'll be glad to um, answer any questions if you have. Um, and uh, thank you for again for letting me be here tonight. And um, I'm also um, ex uh, Yolo County Sheriff's uh, deputy for five years in this county. Um, and uh, currently working as a senior um, business development manager for uh, strategic threat management, our company. So I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have any questions. Thank as you. As this for your is time. a public comment, we actually can't discuss anything. You'd have to leave information with our superintendent. Okay? Excellent. That's our public comment thank policy. Okay. Thank you very so much. Thank you for letting mm -hmm. us know. Sure. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. We have board and superintendent comments. Uh, start with board member Viegas. Um, it's been a busy couple of weeks. I don't know about you guys, mm -hmm. but um, the we had a very successful community giveaway day at Westfield um, on the day Saturday before Thanksgiving. Five hundred and nine families served, which is about one hundred and fifty more than we've ever had before. Uh, they got Thanksgiving dinner from the food bank, um, toys, and coats. Apparently, according to our superintendent, we need some larger size coats for the bigger <laughs> kids. Uh, we usually try to focus on the smaller kids, but um, hopefully next year we will be able to fix that. We had over um, the toys, presents, food, coats, blankets. We had over 150 volunteers from the community, um, 60 kids the day before to set up. A lot of those are River City High School kids and uh, incredibly successful event this year. Norma came out, Linda was there working, um, and I just wanna appreciate everybody that was so supportive of that. We also have another thing going on with the West Sac Police Department, and we've been working with the school social workers to adopt some kids in the district that didn't make it to the community giveaway day. So I'll be posting and sending out emails, trying to gather some gifts, some last minute gifts from uh, just about 200 kids that need um, some Christmas help. So a lot of, we've been dealing with a lot of that stuff. Some of you know my mom's been in the hospital uh, since October 1st, and she's getting out tomorrow, so um, we're really excited about that. And um, we have, we've gone to the, the labor dinner with Kobe, and we went to the um, West Sac Foundation holiday stocking event, 
at Yolo Brew, um, and there's a ton of other things that I'm sure you guys will share, but that's all I can remember right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Board Member Pivati. Oh my gosh. Um, I just wanted to comment about the CSBA conference that we went to. It was an amazing conference, and um, I'm probably going to steal a little bit of Linda's thunder on this, but one of the classes I sat on that I thought was absolutely wonderful was the Visual and Performing Arts Connection to College and Career Readiness. Um, it was absolutely amazing, and, and some of the um, ways that they described how the brain functions with you know, performing arts and music and how it ties in both hemispheres of the brain, and, and you know, they also showed an analysis of how you know, students that engage in some of the performing arts and, and music um, tend to have lower dropout rates. They have higher daily attendance. And I thought that was really fascinating. One of the other, um, one of the other classes that I attended that was really fascinating was um, the uh, the hot topics in sports, and it touched on concussions, Title IX, um, uh, sudden cardiac arrest. They said sudden cardiac arrest is number two major injury, right behind concussions. So I thought it was very fascinating, and they. Fortunately, gave us some handouts so I can pass that along to everybody on the board as well. Um, I also took a lobbying 101 class, as that's kind of an interest of mine. Um, there's another one that I'm forgetting. Oh, interest based bargaining, um, which is something I think is a very um, hot topic right now, and it's an interest, interesting idea, and it's something that, you know, we should all consider it and maybe in the future and going forward it might be something of interest for all of us. Um, it was a great class and I would love to see more of a discussion on that. Okay. Board Member Alcar? It was wonderful attending the California School Board Association and we were very strategic. Each of us um, chose different areas. Um, you just heard from um, Mr. Pizzotti, and Sarah will uh, also uh, give you an update on some of the cl um, classes she attended over there. I attended two that I felt were very important. One was on Medi-Cal reimbursements. That can really mean a lot of money to our district and for our kids. And the other one was um, there was some on curriculum and policy, and there was one that I did attend, and it was on the state bond that's um, going to be on the ballot in 2016. And I didn't know, but when we get this bond, it's normally like a 50-50, but even in our district, we have an existing bond, we would have it matched by 40%, and um, that also is something, yes, quite a bit, I know. I was also very impressed. So that would also mean a lot more um, for our kids in the district. Um, and then what I um, wanted to mention is I just met with uh, Art Pimentel across the street and with uh, Superintendent Ortiz, and um, they wanted me to mention that this Saturday, December 12th, from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m., uh, <coughs> they have Jump Start to College, and this is for juniors and seniors um, in, in our high schools, and it's to learn about um, the SCC Advanced Education Program. Um, it helps them complete English and math assessments and hear from student service, academic counseling, financial aid professionals, and how attendance bumps up class registration. So we want to really encourage um, River City and YOLO students to attend this. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Board Member Kirby Gonzalez. Okay. Um, yes, uh, CSBA this year, there were a lot of great workshops, got a lot of good information, and so I'm going to... Um, I'm still digesting. I have pages and pages of notes and compile some of that and make it so it's an easier um, information to share. And I'm not going to talk for hours right now. But um, so to be coming, some of those pieces. But to give you a highlight, one was civic learning. Um, the facts are really staggering when they talked about um, 18 to 24 year olds in California were more likely to have been arrested than to have voted. Mm -hmm. And so we talked a lot about that. What does that mean? Um, for our kids, for our juries. If you're sitting on a jury and you're uh, a jury of your peers and they don't understand um, the government structure, what does that say? And so how do we engage our kids in um, civic discourse and really get them to be active citizens? 
and you could have some good input on this piece too. So um, we'll have more information coming on that. I looked at some uh, resolutions, that County Office of Ed's doing a lot of work with that. Um, but what does that mean? What does that look like? And how can we as board members help with this? And um, so that was a really great um, piece. One was early learning, talked a lot about um, reaching out to those informal caregivers too, those grandparents and the aunts and the uncles and everyone who's watching kids at home uh, before they enter school and how do we tap into that? I know some of our nonprofits do that already. Um, one piece is the Affordable Care Act does pay for a developmental assessment by a pediatrician, but only 28% of kids are getting that now who are young. So how can we really help uh, get our kids ready before they're here and they're in school? Uh, when I asked in one uh, group who was doing great things with preschool, I said, you know, we have a lot of great things happening with preschool. Um, now, what did you do about your folks who um, didn't qualify because they make a little bit too much money, so they couldn't qualify for our great pre -pro free programs, and they make not enough money to pay for a really high quality private program? Uh, what do you do for them? And they said, oh, we're still working on that. Right. <laughs> so I went for answers, and eh. um, but I think it's such an important discussion, and I'm really glad that we have folks on the preschool um, commission who are going to work on that, um, too. Uh, we talked about some of the exciting things around our new buildings and new school buildings that we've even been looking at, and what, is, what do these facilities look like? They're not using very much water at all. They're not using very much electricity at all, if any. And um, they talked a lot about bringing in light and, and having good air uh, circulation and what that does to cognitive development, as well as ways to fund these things, because building a school is so much money, and how are we going to make that happen? Um, so just a lot of great pieces there. We talked about the budget, what the governor wants to see as some priorities, what they think the legislators want to see as some priorities, um, and they don't always match up. And so um, what it might look like for a state bond, what it looks like for a Prop 30 extension, the possibility that maybe our legislators would want to put a um, the facility bond maybe on an earlier ballot, not to get it off the November ballot. So there will be a lot of things coming up um, that we need to really pay close attention to. And with that, um, President Obama did just sign um, ESEA, and so it does give us flexibility um, in states and local level, which is uh, a big responsibility for us, and it comes with a lot, and I know we've been working hard on that, but um, exciting time, but a, with a big responsibility. Uh, and I think we're live streaming. It looked like we were live streaming now, because I checked board, it, there was an option. So, um, Okay. Kudos. Yeah, good. So we had just talked about that. And now our board <coughs> meetings, it looks like you can go online. And so we can tell folks that they can live stream our videos now um, for all of the millions of people out there that really want <laughs> to watch these. Um, and I'm really happy to see Area 3 um, writing project on tonight's agenda. That's an exciting thing to see. Um, and thank you to Becky for all that you've done. And we appreciate you. So good luck in your next journeys as you <laughs> Thank you. And with our superintendent and some of our board members off at CSBA, uh, the assistant soups and myself, we held down the district pretty well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to thank the board that w uh, was able to go. I know uh, Katie and I have been to some San Francisco ones, I think Norma. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great opportunity, especially when you're new on the board, to just um, – they have so many workshops, it's just overwhelming, but it, it's a nice thing to go to. They alternate um, every year, the conference, San Francisco or San Diego. So it was, I thank you guys for going and representing West Sacramento and uh, bringing back the information and, and the little goodies you brought us. It's always nice. <laughs> um, I just want to um, give a shout out to all of our schools because um, during the holidays, it's kind of hard because of, of all the different religions and beliefs and um, I really want to give kudos to the schools because I, on Facebook, I see, you know, the Christmas trees going up in the libraries, the Santas visiting Elkhorn. Um, I, I think that's some, some of our community, you know, that has been missing for the last few years. So I'm glad to see that it is coming back little by little. And it just, to see the kids happy and even, even the teachers, it's a happy time of year. So um, I just want to give kudos to all of our campuses um, for having that come back little by little. Um, River City High School has so much going on every night. I don't know why you're here, Stan. Who's manning it? <laughs> I was just listening about all the crossover things that are happening. Um, 
I was there last weekend. Uh, they had and they had a girls basketball uh, tournament uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Saturday um, had dual roles. I was at the snack bar Saturday, and we also had a booster craft fair out there. And I think there was something happening at the football field and something in the cafeteria. I know the movie night tomorrow. There's girls basketball going on. It's just a happening place, you know, and I'm going to steal something Stan tells people because Stan and I are, seem to be together at the, all the same locations is he, he says, uh, he said, told me one night, he said, you know, we had three events this week and we were both at all three of them, <laughs> you know, one night after another. So um, that's just a happening place. I mean, it's such a great campus. It's nice to be so big and be able to have all those activities going on. Um, I was very... Um, impressed to be part of the Wiley Dedication Building, to hear the family speak, to hear her co-workers speak. Um, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with her, but um, I felt like I knew her. And so to dedicate that building to her was just spectacular. And um, I was glad I was able to, to be there for that. And um, I also want to uh, wish everybody a happy and safe holiday, but I do want to let you know the boys have been, they had, the boys basketball at River City, they played last night, tonight, tomorrow night, Saturday night. <laughs> you know, my son was up at 3 o'clock in the morning doing laundry. I said, what are you doing? Um, but they are, they have their first home games next week. So if you get a chance and you're bored next Monday and Wednesday night, you should come out and see it. I know uh, Katie and Oscar have donated a, $100 the last few years for our half-court shot. And thank you very much. And uh, hint, hint, if you want to do it again, we're... <laughs> But um, it's just a nice time to come out so, um, and support the River City High School Athletic Department. And uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Board um, Superintendent Luna. Good evening, Board of Trustees, staff, and audience members. There is a lot going on in the <laughs> district, and I, when I was putting together my my update, I, I was missing so much because um, I kept hearing President Cruz, Linda, only 10 minutes, only 10 minutes. <laughs> but all that to say is um, there's a lot of work going on for our children and a lot of work going on for our staff, and it is so wonderful to be a part of this great district that's really moving forward and moving quickly um, on behalf of our kids. So um, I did leave out my CSBA information because I knew our trustees were going to be sharing, but I did just want to say it was a really wonderful week last week, learning and seeing other trustees, what are other school districts doing, and what could we bring back um, into our district. So it is, um, we have some ex exciting times ahead. Um, I think what I'd like to do for this evening is just start um, by honoring our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, who, after 30 years of service in public education, um, will be retiring um, at the end of this month. And 30 years is a long time. And that means that she's helped a lot of people and so I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to her and thank her um, and thank her on behalf of the district. Okay, let's see, I'll try to go quickly here. Um, since our last board meeting, uh, we did have a nice collaboration with our city um, in working um, towards improved safety for our students and our families. And this particular um, collaboration was increasing the LED traffic beacon crosswalk. So the district and the city both partnered in sharing the costs to help our crosswalks to become safer. And I, I actually pass through this crosswalk every single morning um, while the River City High School kids are trying to get into class before that tardy bell rings. And let me tell you, the um, flashing LED traffic lights are, are a great asset to that particular intersection, especially at night. Um, and so we, we had a great collaboration and President Cruz spoke on behalf of the district. So it was a very, uh, really good morning. 
Uh, I attended, uh, for the first time, our dance show at River City High School. And let me tell you, that is one professional production. Mm -hmm. um, I was completely blown away. I looked at the program and I thought, oh, wow, we're going to be here for a very long time. <laughs> but let me tell you, the teacher, and, and I'll bring her name up in the next few slides, that is one professional person because it was an amazing amazing show. So I just have a couple of snapshots here. And by the way, it was packed, completely packed. People were sitting on the floors um, because seats in the stands were all taken. And th also the beauty of it is to see the little kids who are not in school yet be totally um, enthralled by the high school kids. And they were just replicating what they what they were seeing on the dance floor. So here's, here's an example, and, and then here's another one. And it wasn't just one group. I mean, they had groups in the classes just changing out in the middle of the songs. It, it was, I was just totally blown away. And of course, we also um, had the Ballet uh, de Folklorio also represented there at the high school. And I, I always love that program, always. And I sure would love to see it larger. I would love to see that at our elementary schools, as an after school um, class where our kids can really dig deep into the beautiful heritage of, um, of what that particular program brings. So a big shout out and a thank you to our teacher, Constantina Adams, who really put that show together. And the 200 dance wow. kids, it was wow. amazing. Amazing. I wanted to also share, um, since our last board meeting, I had the opportunity um, to attend the nation's Tech Hire Community Summit. And I, I was very um, honored to be able to represent uh, the educational part in the Sacramento region over there. It was a White House only invitation. And um, it was an incredible experience to see what could possibly happen should West Sacramento uh, be able to partner with the city of Sacramento and enter into this kind of a grant. It would bring amazing opportunities to our high school kids to, number one, either choose the path of college or, number two, choose the path of career based on specific training so that they could leave and enter into a career making um, a good sixty dollars to $80,000 starting salary because of the incredible training in technology that they could enter into um, in a career. So basically, the, um, the whole theme of the tech hire concept is to really create an ecosystem so that our high school students have opportunities to enter into the workforce not starting at minimum wage, but really starting at very high paying salaries because of training in technology. And technology not necessarily being in a technology company like in the Silicon Valley, like Oracle or something like that, but in industries where um, technology is used, and we, didn't, we don't really think about that, like in healthcare. Healthcare and manufacturing companies, they all are based in technology. And so it just really opened my eyes to see how our kids can be connected um, leaving high school. So I had the opportunity to hear our United States Chief Technology Officer, who is Megan Smith. Um, and she actually was the Vice President of Google. And she now serves in this capacity. And so she brought out some pretty amazing uh, facts. Um, in the United States, there are over $500,000 tech jobs that go unfilled. And they go unfilled because our kids aren't ready to take those jobs. Um, secondly, one of the ways in which we can um, help our kids in this kind of a program to immediately go into very high paying jobs or to the college route of technology um, in their particular area of discipline is, to, is the concept of boot camps and helping them to be completely mentored in very intensive uh, study of a four to six week program. Um, they're targeting 16 to 24 year old youth. So even when they get out of college, they could still have this opportunity. And I think about my son 
Though my son is 28, when he graduated, he said, Mom, you promised that if I went to college and I got my degree that I would be getting a job. I can't get a job. I've put out 99 applications. I, don't, I didn't know how to answer that. And so we want to, this is a reality for all of our kids, even when they get out of college. How can they get a good job? In the targeting of our uh, 16 to 24 year old youth, uh, should we enter into this kind of a grant, those are the three areas that they would really be um, honing in on, on coding. And basically what the Chief Technology Officer of the United States said, the bottom line is that every single student in school needs to learn how to code because that would be the basis of wherever they go to college or wherever they go to work. I also had the opportunity to hear our United States Department of Labor Secretary Thomas Perez, who was very, very inspirational. And um, there was one phrase that really hit home with me, and I thought about us here in West Sacramento. And he uh, began his very passionate talk saying that we cannot be two Americas. And what he meant by that is we cannot continue in a nation of haves and have-nots. We have to close that gap to help those who are, who are without, who don't know that they have these opportunities to be able to have so that our entire nation would then flourish. And I think about that for West Sacramento too. I think about that for our North schools. I think about that for our South schools, that we are one district. We are not two Washington Unified School District parts and components, we are one. And so when one school flourishes, our whole district will. And so that's the concept that I really walked away with from the Department of Labor. Another part of that we cannot be two Americas, and this hit home with me too, is that zip codes and sections of a city cannot determine one's success. And we have to believe that. That has to be our base of all of our students in West Sacramento. That no matter where you live, what school you attend, it does not determine your future. So again, technology, uh, he really hit home that fluency is needed everywhere and in every field, in every job, in every position. Moving on, uh, this morning, President Obama uh, signed the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the ESSA. I just love how they come up with all of these, uh, <laughs> these acronyms here, but basically it's the reauthorization of what has been in place for many, many years, which is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And that's what No Child Left Behind was based on. It was just renamed. And so now it's renamed. Every Student Succeeds Act. And basically how it affects us here is that um, it's going to be more um, shifted to state responsibility. Instead of having the federal uh, education department come down on school districts, it's going to be more on the state level. And it is a huge responsibility for the state of California. The other thing is that it's going to um, really put a box around the ability of what the Secretary of Education um, is able to do in local school districts. So basically, Secretary of Education at a federal level is going to be limited to those three areas. The timeline is 2016-17, when most of the act will be put in place. So as this starts to roll out, we will give an update to the board. How is this going to affect us? And lastly, they're looking at interventions, which I think is a good thing, and that's going to be rolled out in 2017-18. All of this is tied into what we are doing for college and career readiness for our kids. And I just wanted to assure the board, you heard the presentation of how our kids did in the last uh, first year test of the new standards last spring. We saw the data. We have a lot of work to do. But I want to assure the board that all teachers, all classified staff, all administration, all district office are very focused on two areas. And that is our English learner achievement and our students of poverty achievement. Because we have to go back to that. Uh, we do not have two, um, two Americas. We do not have two sections of West Sacramento. We are just one. And so we're very, very focused on that. 
Um, I had the chance to go to a VAPA staff development, and it was re I loved it. I was able to sit and collaborate with um, an art teacher and a dance teacher about weaving in English learner standards into the arts. Mm. And I just loved that. So um, that, that was probably the best part of my day, being uh, with the two teachers at that time. We've also been doing classroom walkthroughs. I spent a half day at River City High School, specifically going into classrooms with the administrative team, not looking so much at the teachers, but looking specifically at certain students. Are, we, are our students engaged in learning? How can we help them? And so I loved it. That was the best part of my day on that day, is being able to be with kids. Just a few things I want to put on the board's radar. February 6th um, is going to be a very special Saturday, and it's called the Steps to College. The California Department of Education and the Consulate General of Mexico and Sacramento are combining um, work together on behalf of students who are undocumented to have opportunities to go to college. And so there's going to be a university fair, basically uh, private universities, uh, state universities, from all over the United States will be represented at this particular fair, as well as colleges from Mexico to help recruit students, particularly students who are undocumented. The other thing is that they're going to have workshops for parents so that they can understand what to do in college ad admissions and how to apply for financial aid. The other date I'd like to put on the board's radar, and we would love to be able to register you, is on March 8th. Uh, as part of the Equity Summit in Yolo County, they're bringing in a uh, guest speaker, Dr. Pedro Nagara, and he's going to be um, doing a four-hour dinner and summit on systems change for social justice. Uh, Dr. Nagara used to be a board member in Berkeley Unified, but he is currently serving as a professor down in Southern California and very passionate about the concept of equity in public schools. So if you are interested, we will be happy to um, get you registered. Well, I'm expecting the entire administrative team to go. I'm also expecting the administration to invite teachers to attend as well. <sighs> Winter break will be next week. A yeah, well-deserved break for everybody, but to our parents and our community who's watching, uh, next Thursday is a minimum day. Just want to remind everybody, and also that our school district offices and schools will be closed between Jan December 18th and January 1st. And please remember to come back to school on Monday, January 4th. <laughs> that's, that's probably the most important line for all of our parents. So it is great to be WUSD, great place to be. It's been a wonderful first semester, and I just want to wish everybody, the board, and all staff, happy holidays and enjoy uh, um, a well-deserved two-week break. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you, Linda. We are to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of, is it which? O, o 15. O 15. Can I get a motion to? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 So um, O 14. The approval of the MOU between Edwin, oh, I'm sorry, O 15. Sorry, I keep <laughs> skipping. Approval of the agreement of partner and the use of facilities between the City of West Sacramento and Washington Unified School District. Um, do you want to, is it Bill or is it Scott that brought this forward? I know we talked about it last time. Was it Scott? Do you want to just give us a quick scenario on what it was last time? And then I think there's some questions. Sure. Um, it, it's what's in your agenda packet uh, is a, a recap of the process we've gone through. Um, the November 12th meeting, uh, we brought a document to the board. Uh, document was um, a collaboration between the city and the district that replaced uh, four existing documents uh, for um, uh, facility uh, use in between both the city and the school district. Um, board asked us to have the document go back, uh, go through council, and uh, be brought again and put on consent agenda once uh, council's changes were made, uh, including uh, 
the, the key provision that this is, was not a cooperative agreement, it was a partnership. So um, made those changes, document went through council. Uh, that is a document that was posted to the agenda tonight under consent item 015. Thank you. I think we have some questions from the board or comments. Is this board member Alcala? Thank you. First, I want to say I really want to thank the city for um, and wanting to enter into this um, continued partnership with, with our district. But I, I did have some questions um, when I saw the, um, the contract. And um, I went ahead and enumerated them on, on these two pages. I believe I handed um, them to everyone. And um, so I, I guess, Mr. Gunn, um, have you had a chance to review some of the concerns I had with some of the language? I have. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a number, uh, mm -hmm. as you know. Uh, I can address them if you'd like now, but given the level of detail in this excellent analysis of the, of the agreement, um, I can also do it in writing and resubmit it to the board and we can address it at a later time, whatever is your preference. Well, um, I did have some concerns with, with some of the, as I said, some of the language on here. And I know you reviewed it. Were these same concerns that I had also addressed in, in your analysis? They would be. Is that I, I just received the questions, as you know, at the beginning of the meeting. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what analysis you refer to. Uh, my understanding was when the attorneys would uh, review the contract, certain changes would be, modifications would be made to it. So I guess that's what that's, I was asking. Have they been done yet? or? Have the modifications been made to some of the Not to address the questions I received okay. tonight. All right. Oh. But no, we, had, we had a discussion at the last board meeting, and we had some suggestions and some um, uh, corrections. And at looking at it, those corrections have been done. Okay. Um, I you. know what we did talk about was um, in the future, these could possibly be amendments to, to this. But I thought in talking to the board, we were okay with what was presented to us. And um, I think this is something that can maybe be, you can analyze this and give us a report to see if it's something we would like to put as an amendment. Oh, I'd be a, happy to. And frankly, it would not be an amendment because the agreement is in draft at this point. Good. Uh, as okay. Mr. Landsberger noted, the effort uh, is to, com to address in one agreement what is now the subject of four agreements with the city to put it all in one place mm -hmm. and simplify the matter. Uh, but we could certainly do that. I was unaware that these questions might have been raised at an earlier time before. You know. No, they weren't enumerated. There were okay. some that I have also um, included in my concerns. Mm -hmm. We can but this certainly is much, address much those. Much lengthier. That's great. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay. And if you have specific questions now, I'd be happy to, to discuss them with you. Or what I might suggest is I could scan this into okay. a new document and then interlineate my input on each of the issues for you so you'd have a detailed response to each of the issues you've raised. I think a written um, response would be great in the interest of, of time here. Okay. Um, and then we can My concern is it, this. it's on the consent agenda. It was. I know you pulled it to discuss it, but um, we kind of already requested our changes at the last board meeting, and the way this was presented, and, and we did discuss if at a a then, later date that we want to add to it, we can revisit it with the city. Then perhaps we need Certainly. to go through it. I thought it was, I thought the board kind of all agreed last time to put it on the consent to approve it. Well, then let me go ahead and. So um, in that context, right. I'm sorry, but, but in that context to address it in the amendments in the future, now that I understand your question, yes, that could certainly be done. Right. And to reassure the board, I do not see any issues here of such great magnitude that it could not be addressed in, a, in amendments to the agreement in the future. And many of these are, are addressed easily. Right. And that's I, don't, what, I do not see great risk to the district at all in the agreement as drafted. And I thought that was what the board kind of agreed upon last time. If, if things came up, we could make amendments in the future. But will we, we be will? able to make these amendments that with the concerns that I have? Everything from right to entry, the sale of property. Well, it has to be a discussion yes. amongst the board. Yes, right. and, and to address, for example, the right to entry, uh, the suggestion is to remove a clause at the very end of that provision. I believe it's Article 5. Um, 
as written, it says that the district has the right to enter at any time to inspect. Period. It could be a period right there. Or it said, or to intervene in the case of any kind of water, you know, the circumstance that requires attention, repair, cure, et cetera. So there's always that right to, to enter. Uh, another example I would give you uh, would be the uh, term. There's the suggestion to add without cause for clarity. The language as drafted is clear that it's for any reason or no reason. I guess one of my concerns that I addressed, like in paragraph uh, 2C, um, the lease provides that the city is allowed ac equal access to all organizations, and it, it was so general. Um, I guess my questions were, what limitations are there? Um, could the city sublease a, a listed facility to another educational organization, such as a charter school, for no, example? No, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Two reasons. One, this is not a lease. It's essentially a license agreement. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, in, if you uh, see Article 14 regarding assignment, mm -hmm. it says that the agreement uh, is subject to consent for assignment, and that consent can be withhold for any, withheld for any reason or no reason. The original draft did not include that caveat. And in, in the absence of the language that I proposed, a party cannot object to an assignment without legitimate reason. You know, that it, there has to be some reason for it. In this case, now you can have no reason by adding for any reason or no reason, the district can refuse. But I also understand that the context of this agreement for the types of facilities, they're not the type of facility that they would sublease if that were, if it applied, but it's not a lease. They, they can't give it to anyone else to use. If they were to even propose it, the district has say so, an ultimate say so, to say no, thank you very much. Okay, um, paragraph 2F, um, I saw that there's no dispute resolution clause and um, I, I guess some of the clauses I had problems with, it, it didn't seem to have mutuality whatsoever in, in some of the ones I outlined, like paragraph 2F, um, paragraph 3. Before we go to 3, mm -hmm. may I ask clarification, please? In 2F, it says uh, there is a dispute the, uh, resolution please. clause that is not in a parallel city. Can I ask for a clarification of parallel city? All right. Um, let's see. Where are we? Paragraph 2F. Durham uses. Use of property, right? Okay, here we go. Um, use of property. I'm so going through the old agreement, through the proposed agreement. I, as I read 2F, mm -hmm. it says with respect to facilities or school sites available for use by the city other than those as specified in attachment A. What that tells me is attachment A specifically limits the agreement, the district facility subject to this agreement. There are only two. And then for all others, they must make a specific request for that use in compliance with all other district uh, procedures that exist, namely the Civic Center Act. And they have to do that as, as soon as possible. And in scheduling, uh, it says if there's a, uh, the, the superintendent of the district and the city manager will attempt to resolve any disputes concerning conflicts in scheduling and or use of district facilities. That keeps it out of legal channels, which is nice, avoids undue legal expense, and it means that the two heads of the two organizations will work it out if there's a problem that rises above staff, which I don't anticipate. But, but that my, only applies to the district, not to the city. I'm sorry? Like when there's a resolution. The dispute who's, resolution who's is in standing? another provision of the agreement. It or says the if there's any dispute, it'll be governed by California law. Uh, that's the dispute resolution provision. On paragraph 2F. And it, it's not in 2F. No, that's... It's a separate... It. What I'm... I'd like to address your need regarding 2F where it says the dispute resolution clause that is not in a parallel city. I don't get the reference to parallel city. In the cities... In, in the cities... Um, there's no mutuality, I guess. That's what I'm trying to say. It's, it doesn't say the same thing for the city in terms of dispute resolution. Each of Should the clauses is crafted. So with, you're saying that they're mutual. Each I of the clauses the is the agreement, uh, is, is reciprocal from use of the facilities in 2A, B, and C for the district. In 3 is the city's facilities. They track 2. And then the indemnity provisions are reciprocal to a word. 
Okay, I guess I just didn't read it that way, and that's why I had that question. Okay, I, I'd be happy to sit with you and, and, and right. make sure I understand your need and then explain it or address anything that I'm missing. Happy right. to do that, but I don't see 2F as a dispute resolution provision. Right. On paragraph three, the mutual dispute resolution clause should be added to paragraph three. Under the use of city property? Yes. That, like, too, is that the city manager and the, and the superintendent will resolve the matter. And I have a reference to C3D, Article 3, subparagraph D, second sentence. The superintendent for the district and the city manager for the city shall attempt to resolve any disputes concerning conflicts. That's the same language that was in 2F you were asking about. Okay, because I only saw that to, to represent um, the mutual as I said, on the mutuality, I, I saw that only um, on <coughs> the district rather than the city's um, r resolution dispute. Well, Article 2 addresses use of district facilities. All right. So when we're dealing with use of district facilities, if the parties for some reason, reason have any disagreement that staff can't address, it'll be addressed by the superintendent and the city manager. So that's as to district facilities. And then if we look in Article 3, which addresses city facilities, when we're dealing with the district's desire to use city facilities of any type, those enumerated in the agreement, which are subject to the agreement, and those which are not specifically listed, which are subject to the district's obligation to then use the city's procedures. Like in the district's case, we only have two facilities subject to the agreement. If they want to use another facility outside that, for example, River City High School or something else, it's not subject you go under the Civic Center Act. Similarly, if the district wants other than the city facilities listed, they would go under the parallel for the Civic Center Act for the city. And in both cases, if there's any inability to connect on a certain use, the two heads of the two organizations will work it out if it goes above staff, okay. which... I understand. I guess my only concern was I wanted the language to be identical for both. Can I ask a question on, sure. on that? If the two heads cannot meet resolution, like the city manager or the superintendent, um, who then decides on under where you read the, the superintendent for the district and the city manager for the city shall attempt to resolve any disputes concerning conflicts in scheduling and or use of, of the facilities. So you said at that point, and it's my understanding that the four other agreements that have affected the district's use of city facilities and the city's use of the district facilities has gone on for many years now. That's not occurred. But if it were to occur in that situation, I would suspect that the board would be consulted and get your guidance and the city council would be consulted okay. and get their guidance. And if there was ever a, an agreement that could not be reached to work it out, which again hasn't happened, the agreement is subject to a 90-day termination clause for any reason or no reason. Okay. Right. But I understand, given the district, your answer just brought up the the thought in my mind. That's all I. Yeah, think. it's fine. It, it's okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then paragraph five a um, under fixtures and improvements. Um, I, I had some concerns. Um, normally, in real property, you know, you're you're not allowed to take fixtures such as chandeliers and such. You know, um, when when you you when you're leasing I mean, you can take a chandelier from a house and here it would allow the city to put fixtures in and then be able to take them out um, you know and if we wanted to keep them they could be 20 years old and we'd, and we'd have to pay for something that um, just wouldn't make any sense to take out in the first place so I guess I just had some, some real concerns with, with the language in here. I mean, I it says, add fixtures after the improvements in sentence three, and the following language as in sentence four and five, any applications for grants for improvements of the district property shall be joint applications of the parties unless contrary to the law, and such improvements and fixtures shall be considered joint um, partnership projects of the parties. So now, um, you keep mentioning lease. This is not a lease, it's correct? It's not a lease. That's and there are separate difference. issues. There was a, com a, co a combination of issues in 5A and 5C. Uh, to address first your comments on 5C about fixtures not being removed mm -hmm. in a residential lease versus commercial context, okay. uh, 
two things to consider there. In the commercial lease context, which this isn't a lease, typically tenant improvements are left in the absence of an agreement. So they are. Um, I've never seen any sub, one comment that was made about a sprinkler system being installed, mm -hmm. subterranean. I've never seen a subterranean improvement be, with, uh, be removed, ever. I think what they're talking about in cases like this is certain above ground play structures, et right. cetera. But we could certainly add a provision in there saying that uh, a lim limited to above ground improvements. There was also a comment about, well, then they could tear up the ground and ruin the grass. But there's a provision in the agreement that says anything that's removed, you have to return the, the, the property to its original condition. Mm -hmm. So that example would not apply. I have to disagree with that entirely. Right. Um, that they would have to bring it back to its original condition and leave it in a, whatever condition they found it, turfed or what have you. But going to back to paragraph 5A about fixtures, and, or I'm sorry, the joint application. The, I haven't had time to research that issue, but my guess is, and I, and I know this by experience, the, the grants that are available to a city are typically different than the grants that are available to educational institutions. So to then say, well, we want every application for a grant to be a joint application may well compromise the ability of the requesting party or parties to get the funds. I guess, so I, I'm sorry, I apologize. No, I that's all right. Say, uh, so uh, mm -hmm. I get your point in, in the partnership, I think, is the, the essence of the agreement. We could add where, where applicable or where beneficial to the parties. Um, and then for the partnership on the projects, I don't, I don't have any problem with the joint partnership that the, the, the agreement is termed that it's a partnership for the benefit of the whole community. That's, that's, as I understand, the partnership that's been in place for many years between your district and the city. Um, there may well have been some tensions at different times that happens with people, but there's been a long-term effort here of making the facilities of the different entities available to the whole community. And that's what I see this doing. Well, I, I know contracts aren't made, you know, when everything's going great, you know, you have these of contracts. Of course, I agree when, entirely. When things are not going great. Yes, I agree entirely. And um, fortunately, that's where a termination provision exists to benefit the district. And frankly, with regard to your comment about the improvements being installed, this was an area of concern for me and continues, and we can always add something in the agreement depending. But to pay for straight line depreciation was the language that is, was ultimately inserted. So it's at the depreciated value. So for example, when you say, uh, speak of an improvement, and as I understand the district properties are a playground, baseball fields with backstops and things, mm -hmm. uh, and playgrounds, <coughs> pardon me, playground structures, unlikely to be, that you'd want them out at, at a certain point, but also whatever value 20, 30 years hence is gonna be negligible. At that point, well, what did you pay? Straight line depreciation over 30 years or 20 years. It's not gonna be a grand, uh, a, a grand uh, expense for the district. One other comment I'd make, um, is there was a comment in the questions about, well, if the city terminates the agreement, then they could require the district to pay for these improvements. That's not in the agreement anywhere. It says if the district terminates the agreement, the city can require that. It doesn't say if the city terminates the agreement, they can require that. All right, I misunderstood that then. That's okay. a key distinction, and it's one that now you have to be aware of. If the city were to raise that, I'd reject it wholehearted and say, no, I'm sorry. Okay. At least that would be my recommendation for the board. I hate to say things strategically like that that are of such great import, mm -hmm. but there's a reason why that isn't in the agreement. All right. It's only if we terminate. You address the right of entry, um, and then paragraph seven, sale of the property. The sale of property. Um, the sale of property by a school district is governed by the surplus property statutes that say if you decide you no longer need a piece of property for educational purposes to benefit the district, that you then by statute have to offer it to certain public agencies in order of seniority, uh, what I call seniority, but Parks and Rec and others. It's only then that you would then go out to the private market if you wanted to. And what this is saying that if you do that, they get one more bite at the apple essentially but they would have already rejected it in the first instance because you would have had to offer it to them going down that list under the statute. So they're not really getting anything other than what they've already been given. And if they didn't want it the first time, I doubt they're gonna want it the second time. And the, 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 frankly, the terms you would offer it to a private party could easily be different than those to a public. They're usually more beneficial to a, 
public agency than they are to a private party. I guess um, my um, concern with this one is, let's say we were to have um, a nursing school come in, you know, and uh, we had some property available at no cost. We have our students come in. We put the nursing school in there. Agreed. What do we have to offer, first to the city, that property where we would want to put a nursing school in? Not necessarily. I'd want to look at the surplus property statute to check that, but as it says, the intro line is when the, uh, in Article 7, it's after they've complied with all the statutory requirements. If at a time subsequent to the district's compliance with any pertinent and relevant statute or regulation governing the offer for sale of its properties. So only after you've done all that, mm -hmm. that would have, in that context, it would have been offered to the nursing program. Okay. It would already be resolved by that point. All right. And then finally, paragraph 16 under term. Um, let's go back over here. Yeah, the, the without cause, if, if the board signature. is more comfortable with that language, we could do it. Mm -hmm. But the, the concern I have in legal context is if you start including exceptions, it's mm -hmm. like the old including but not limited to. Mm -hmm. in, in statutory interpretation, if you give an example of one, it's of, of, it can be limited to those specific examples. So why do it? By leaving it more broad, you have the options available to you. It actually becomes more restrictive to you to do that. But I have it, the language there is for any reason or no reason, essentially. There's no limitation whatsoever. And then I believe at the last board meeting we used the term, uh, we wanted to use partnership, and, and my only concern with partnership, it seems to imply equal ownership. Do you believe that that's the, that's the legal understanding when we use the word partnership. partnership equals ownership equal ownership no no in, in the business context in the in partners in a business you have different levels of partnership but in this context it, the introductory paragraph <coughs> talks about uh, in partnership of serving the needs of the community but there is certainly if in, in and I appreciate your concern to protect the district I, I clearly understand the import of your concerns um, and applaud them but there's nothing in this agreement that might give rise to a risk to the district's ownership of its property by any stretch. And liability is addressed in the indemnity provision and the obligations. The indemnity language has been strengthened by the fact that before it was risks and injuries arising out of um, attributable to the acts of unless the other party is solely negligent. Well, if the other party is solely negligent, then the first party, the district, didn't do anything wrong in the first place. But they'd be off the hook. I've put in language in the agreement that says if they're, if they're even partially responsible, the term is contributory negligence in law, then they're on the hook for that percentage and they don't get to walk away. But similarly, nor does the district. There's the reciprocity you're looking for as well. I try to draft that into agreement so it's fair. Okay. Uh, so in this case, if one party's at fault, then you pay your percentage of fault if there's ever a determination of liability. Okay. And I just want to address um, real quickly paragraph 5A once more. Um, I'm not saying that our district would apply, or when the city applies for grants, our district would have to give uh, that mutuality there. But I feel that if the city is going to apply for grants in our name, we certainly should be made aware of this. I don't, re there's nothing, well, one, they couldn't. They, they can't apply for grants in your name. Well, they when we, I, well, when we had the um, the Kaboom project, which it wasn't in your name, but it was made on behalf of our of our district, was it not? No. Okay, so they cannot um, apply for grants such as um, preschool grant, for example. Not in the name of the Washington Unified School District. The city can apply for grants for programs that they're by law enabled to provide, and they can apply for available funding. But they can no, they could no sooner apply in the name of your district than they could in the name of the city of Sacramento. Okay. Well, that clar clarifies yeah. a lot. Yeah, thank you for that. All right. Well, those were my questions. Now they were lengthy. But does anyone else have any questions? No, I'd like to make a motion. Second. Well, cool. can I thank Pat for staying sure. in? Sure. Thank you. My <laughs> Thanks, pleasure. Pat. I'm happy to be here. And congratulations <laughs> thank on you. new position. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. And uh, congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much.
So can I have a, a motion to approve the agreement of partner in the use facilities between the City of West Sacramento and Washington Unified? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Action item P1, approval of the Washington Unified School District Financial Statement Independent Audit for 2014-15, Scott Landsberger. And it's not that I'm not interested, but I'm going to run that way and be right back. <laughs> okay. Well, as you know, um, you're required to have a, a financial audit every year. Uh, and we went out uh, in 2014, uh, did an RFP because we were at a cycle where we'd had the same auditor for three years. Uh, we came back uh, to the board and the board took uh, the administration's recommendation to uh, retain Crow Horwith LLP for our audit for the 14-15 school year. And so with us tonight is Mr. Steve Westcote. Uh, he's principal with the organization. He's also CPA of record for your audit and he's going to present your audit to you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Westcote. I'm a partner with Crow Horwath. And uh, as Scott mentioned, we've completed the audit um, of the district. And I have, uh, hopefully, I, you, you each have a copy of the audit report. And, uh, and there's a, an accompanying letter that kind of describes the audit process. Um, I am not going to go through the report page by page. And I do not have a PowerPoint presentation that would do the same thing. So I, what I want to do in my presentation is simply uh, Describe for you in, in basic terms the, the process of the audit, talk about a few key points in the audit report, and then turn it over to you to ask me any questions. So the audit involves basically three areas. There's first is the audit of your financial statements. In, in uh, September of each year, you um, approve the unaudited actuals, which are your internal financial statements. That becomes the basis then for the financial statements that are included in the, the document that we refer to as the audit report. A uh, part of the audit relates to compliance with certain state laws and regulations. The state of California has an audit guide that we're required to follow. Um, key parts of state law and regulation that the state legislature or the various state agencies, either the Department of Finance or the Department of Education, feels are important uh, that we're required to audit. Most of the uh, compliance requirements have to do with funding in one way or another, although there are several pieces of, of the uh, compliance, uh, state compliance area that have nothing to do with funding. It's just because somebody thinks it's important for us to look at. The third part of the audit has to do with <coughs> your compliance with federal laws and regulations. Because you receive federal funding, uh, the federal government through the Office of Management and Budget uh, has audit requirements. And each department uh, actually has their own specific requirements as well. Uh, so uh, we're required to identify the largest of your programs each year. And they're kind of on a cycle basis. Uh, and we're required to get a certain level of coverage of, of testing. And so the audit report includes your financial statements and it includes our reports on each of those areas that I described. The audit is conducted in accordance with government auditing standards, which also requires us to give uh, an opinion on uh, internal controls. So there are basically four uh, audit reports in the, uh, in the document as well. Um, the first is our report on your financial statements, and that's the, the first report is just inside the table of contents. And in layman's terms, it says that the financial statements do present fairly the financial condition of the district. That's called an unmodified opinion, and that's the kind of opinion you want to hear uh, from your auditor. You'll notice if you compare this report to last year's report, there's an extra paragraph in that uh, opinion this year. And that's because of the adoption of a new accounting standard that uh, hopefully you've been made aware of, uh, has to do with pension accounting. And because of the significance of that standard and what it does to your financial statements, we were required to put in uh, a separate paragraph that sort of draws attention to the fact that this was a significant change, had a significant impact on your financial statements. So that's, that's a new paragraph that's in the audit report. But it doesn't change our opinion on your financial statements. There's an opinion on your compliance with state laws and regulations. Uh, that's a very prescriptive um, statement or uh, opinion. It's actually prescribed by the auditing standards, uh, the state's auditing standards. And it, it says basically that you complied with all of the state laws and regulations that we were required to test with one exception. And that had to do with um, the school accountability report cards and the requirement to have a, uh, a facilities inspection tool document for each of the school sites. And last year there were two of the school sites that the facility inspection tool document was not, um, was not done, was not included in the SARC. So we had to 
put that mention that in the in the audit report. It's my understanding that that's already been corrected for this year, so that the process is in place to make sure that each of the school sites has the facility inspection tool document, and, and it will be included in the SARC for uh, for this year. Can you tell me what page that's on? Yeah, the the state compliance opinion is on page starts on page 73. The, the finding related to that is back in the very back of the report um, on page 83. So we have to describe the nature of the, of the exception, and it was at, at River City <coughs> High School and Bridgeway Elementary, or Bridgeway Island Elementary, the two schools where the uh, facility inspection tool was not created. So that's a, that's a requirement to do that every year, and then the information from that facility inspection tool of the FIT is required to be presented in the school calendar report card when it's published on the websites. Thank you. Um, the other two opinions, one is on your compliance with uh, federal laws and regulations. Um, for those of you keeping score at home, that's on page um, 78. Um, and that's, a, again, an unmodified opinion. It says that, in our opinion, the district is in compliance with the federal laws and regulations of the programs that we were required to test this year. Um, we actually tested four programs, and they're listed on page 80 of the report. The uh, Title I program, the Title II program, and two of your child nutrition programs. And then the fourth opinion or fourth report is on your uh, internal control structure. As part of an audit in accordance with government auditing standards, we're required to document and test your internal controls, primarily for the purpose of helping us with our audit, but also if we identify areas that we think are important for you to note about your internal control structure, then we're required to report those to you. <clears throat> we categorize those uh, as deficiencies, and they are kind of in a, a, a scalable uh, determination, if you will, um, with the most significant one be called, uh, being called a material weakness. A material weakness is one, a deficiency such that your financial statements have a high probability of being misstated somehow because of somebody not doing their job correctly or the system not working correctly. Below that is what's called a significant deficiency, which is, again, something that's important enough to bring to your attention, but might not have that same financial impact. And the third, the lowest level is the deficiency, which is sort of a management um, recommendation for improvement. We didn't identify any of those, so that's a good thing. And this, this report is worded differently than the other ones. It doesn't say that everything is okay. It says we didn't find anything wrong. So it's the way that the, the language has to be done. With respect to your financial statements, um, you know, the financial statements uh, are, are your financial statements. Our job is to audit those uh, financial statements. And I mentioned there was a, uh, a significant change this year to the financial results and financial statements as a result of the implementation of two new accounting standards, Governmental Accounting Standards Board, or GASB 68, number 68, statement number 68, and statement number 71. Both have to do with accounting and reporting for pensions and pension obligations. Um, they work in concert with a previously issued statement, number 67, which was implemented last year. GASB 67 required the public pensions, in your case CalPERS and CalSTRS, to calculate their unfunded liability and also to create in their financial statements, in their audited financial statements, schedules that are called Schedule of Proportionate Share, which identifies district by district what your proportionate share of that liability is. And then this year, when GASB 68 and 71 were implemented, it required you to record your liability, your portion of that liability, on your financial statements. Now, the way that this works is that both CalPERS and CalSTRS have actuarial reports, and they use those actuarial reports in doing their annual audits. The information we use to calculate your liability at June 30, 2015, is based on their audit reports for the year ending June 30th, 2014, which is based on the actuarial report that they got for the year ended June 30th, 2013. So there's always going to be a, a one to two year rolling lag in how these numbers are created, but that's the only way it can work. When the, when the standard was implemented, it took into consideration the fact that the pension funds themselves had to do their work before the entities could do theirs. So there's always this, this kind of a rolling um, scenario built into there. So what does this mean to the district? Well, the, the biggest thing is that it had an impact on your government-wide financial statements. Those are the statements right up at the front of the, of the audit report. It has no impact at all on your fund-level financial statements or your unaudited actuals. On the statement of activities, which is on page 12, you will see what we had to do when we implemented this standard is we had to 
adjust your financial statements as if this standard had been in effect all along, which means we had to restate your beginning net position. So the impact to the district was about $55.5 million, a reduction of your net position to recognize your share of the unfunded pension liabilities for CalPERS and CalSTRS. Now their, their portion of the liability, the, the unfunded liability is in the billions of dollars for, for both of those entities. So that was the beginning, beginning uh, adjustment. Your end of year liability, if you look on page, um, I'm gonna give you a couple of page numbers. There, there are footnotes that describe all of these pension liabilities that, that um, begin on about page 40 and they go for nine or 10 pages. It, it has way more detail than anybody would wanna know. But your ending liability for the net pensions uh, is about $46.5 million. So the pension liability actually decreased during the year because of changes in several things. One is the change in your proportionate share. Each year when those schedules are created, the, the pension funds have to redo their schedules. And if your, um, uh, if your, uh, I'm thinking the right word, your, your share of the pension liability is, is based on your creditable earnings for your employees in both PERS and STRS. If your creditable earnings go up in relation to everybody else's, then your proportionate share goes up as well. If yours goes down, it goes down. So this is a reflection of what happened to your, your liability. It went down <coughs> this year from what it would have been last year because the proportionate share changed. It also changes because of other factors which have to do with the amount that you actually had to contribute to the plan as well as the performance of the plans in general. So there's three or four different things that move around that, that change all of these factors. This is probably a lot more information than you wanted to hear about the pensions, but I, I, in, in the point of disclosure, I have to re tell you all about all of this. Um, so it does have an impact on your ending net position at the government-wide level. It does not impact your fund financial statements. And this is something that every year there's gonna be an adjustment to this based on those factors that I just described. So. That's, uh, as I said, hopefully you've, you've been hearing about pension, the pension accounting that's, that's been out there. This isn't the first time we've actually been able to put numbers to it and actually see what it is. Um, if you are interested, if you look in, um, in the notes to the financial statements back beginning on page um, 38, and like I said, it goes for about 10 pages. There's a lot of disclosure about the methodology that those two pension funds use in calculating the liability as, what your, as well as what your um, your liability is, your proportionate share of the CalPERS or the CalSTRS liability is on page 41. It's 0.061%. So your district had 0.061% of the, of the state's, uh, of the CalSTRS liability. It's interesting to note that because of the way that the state helps fund that, the state also makes a contribution to CalSTRS every year. So the state actually shares in your liability for that part of it as well. And your percentage for um, CalPERS is identified on page 45 was 0.095%. So that's, that gives you the relative share for, for each of the districts. Interestingly, I don't believe there was a single district in the state that had over 1%. Even Los Angeles Unified, which is the largest one, I think was right at or just below 1% of the total liability. So you can see that it's being spread around quite a wide, um, a wide number of districts. So that's the impact of, of, of those two new pension statements. You notice I didn't talk about any of your other funds because everything there was okay. There were no audit adjustments, um, the one small state compliance finding, no internal control findings. Um, I do want to thank staff, district staff, for the work that they do, not just getting ready for the audit, but throughout the year because, you know, the, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been auditing school districts for 28 years, and I've been in the auditing and accounting world for 36 years. And I can tell you that it's impossible for somebody to ignore good procedures all year long and then try to get it cleaned up just in time for the audit. So, and in fact, our audit has to look at the systems as they operate throughout the year. So uh, the district staff here do a great job. Um, Scott and his team and Kylie uh, do a tremendous job, and they did a great job in, in helping us through the audit process. So uh, my thanks to them. So. If you have any questions of me about either the audit report or the audit process, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Any questions, comments? Just thank you for your work. Yeah. <clears throat> You're welcome. I did have some questions, but I'm 
hesitant to ask at all, at all because I don't really comprehend everything that you have here so far, and it would take me a long time to read through this before I could even get to a place where I could understand enough to ask an intelligent question. But um, in terms of the liability for the, the, the pensions, um, what is the, the district's um, what is the district's liability right now in terms of percentage versus what is the teacher's um, contribution or the classified employees? I'm, I'm not well. sure that I can quantify that. As I mentioned, this, this liability gets, gets recalculated every year, um, and it's always going to be lagging a year behind. Right. The, the, the contributions, uh, one of the things I should have pointed out, too, is one of the things that's unfortunate about this process is that your contributions, the, the district share of the, of the uh, payroll contributions, all that, are set in statute. So you can't right. just go and change, um, right. you know, if you, you, and, and you wouldn't want to, uh, just arbitrarily change what you want. So you've got, uh, and they're described actually in the notes on page 40, for example, it shows what the rates are uh, under CalSTRS, how uh, the rate was at 8.25%, it's being ratcheted up to 19% over the next seven years. That was a legislative change last year. Um, so the, the, I, I'm not sure if that's answering your question or if that's what you're asking for, but those are the rates that are established in statute that you contribute and the employees contribute each year to the plan. No, I, I'm good. No, ask what you need to ask. <laughs> ask any questions. No, I did. <laughs> yes. um, well, I, I just saw something today in the in the newspaper about uh, a potentially new pension initiative that would be, I think, detrimental to all school districts and all, um, uh, I think, all public employees everywhere. Where it would, uh, moving forward, it would say all new public employees would go into a 401k style system. How would that dramatically impact our um, our ability to, well, I mean, wouldn't that hurt the security of the current fund? I, you know, I, I haven't seen that report, and I don't know the answer to that question. I, I don't know how that would impact um, any district for that matter. Yeah, I, I can uh, it, it's, it's my understanding that when if something like that were to happen, <laughs> there would be a grandfather clause that would allow people who are already in the system to stay in it no, it, you can't. You can't retroactively hit people. Right. It would be only for right. the new hires. But my, I guess what my my <clears throat> my comment on that would be is, it would a crush our ability to recruit and retain teachers and all classified employees for that matter. But secondarily, wouldn't it hurt the existing fund because you're losing the contribution going into it going forward? I, I I can't make I, I don't know. No, that's I don't all right. That's I, I know I'm asking you something. <laughs> yeah, out of your, out of you'd your... have to get a uh, you'd have to get a financial analyst up here, not a not an auditor. Okay. <laughs> we know our team is doing a good job, and this just feels really good because it reiterates it. And so thank you for um, putting this together in a way that's really easy to look through and read. Um, it's really easy to look through and see. Um, all of the pieces that you've put here, although of course it takes some time to <laughs> really look through and digest yeah, it. But um, thank you for that. And, uh, you're welcome. And thank you to the team. Thank you. We have a public comment from Don Stoffer. Hi, thank you. Uh, basically, I just have one quick question. If I'm understanding the presentation correctly, the, if, in the event that our uh, CalSTRS system were to be fully funded, I believe right now it's about 68%, that means the teacher share of the GASPI 68 then would fall to zero, that liability. Am I understanding that correct? Um, I, don't, I don't think that's a correct statement. And it, it's not, the liability is not broken down between district share and teacher share. The, the teacher's contribution is, is um, determined by statute, what, what they pay in. So the legislature would have to make a change on what those rates are. And all we're really doing here is we're showing, and, and this is a new accounting standard, I should point out, too, that this didn't just apply to California school districts. <clears throat> this applies to every governmental entity in the United right. States. Right. And so it's, what it's saying is that this liability that exists at the, at the fund level 
needs to be recognized at the participant level, and that the participant is the district. So we're saying this is what the liability looks like uh, at an individual district level, and there's really nothing that you can do about it. There's not, you, you're not going to go out and try to pay this thing down. I would, not, I would not even remotely suggest you go out and issue bonds to pay this down because it won't do you any good. Um, you, you could pay yours down, and CalSTRS and CalPERS would say thank you, and then they would reallocate and give you a new proportionate share next right. year. Right. So it doesn't matter. And, and so it's all based on what the legislature does in terms of the statutory rates, as well as how well PERS and STRS do with their right. investments, because the, the contributions from employees and, and districts for, Cal, per, for CalSTRS, for example, make up about 25 to 30 percent of their earnings. The other 70 to 75 percent is made up of their investments. So you can raise your rate, you could double your rates, and we'd still be in the same situation because it doesn't, it doesn't fill that gap. They have to do extremely well in the marketplace to, to get that up there. And so, right. and, and the, these pension funds are still recovering from what happened in 2008, like, like we all are. So we're still coming back out of that. It's going to be a while before that happens. Yeah. So it's, but it's not, I don't want it, to, it's not that there's a liability going down the individual teacher level. That's not the point. It's the, level, the liability is at the district level. Yeah, I think the teacher contribution rate was set in Pepper. Yeah, the, wasn't the contribution it? rates are set in, in, in law, and right. so they're, the only way that they would change is if the legislature changed them. Right. Any more questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need a <laughs> motion to approve the Washington Unified School District financial statement uh, independent audit for 2014 15. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Item P2, approval of the first interim financial report for fiscal year 2015-2016. Good evening. Um, I'm going to start off by handing uh, to the board again. Uh, oh, uh, Scott, sir. I'm sorry. Can I stop? I did notice it. 1001. <laughs> so you we're need done. A motion. Thank you. You are here. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Are you just going to approve well, it? It's awesome. So long. <laughs> I do need a motion to continue. So I'll move. move. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Scott. You're welcome. But ten minutes. Late. It is late. You're going <laughs> late. Tomorrow. Less than ten minutes. We're going we're gonna to change things up on you just a little bit. I'm going to pass out. Uh, if you remember, at budget, we gave you a, a card oh, uh, that talked card. about uh, difference in between your um, unaudited actuals and budget. I'm going to pass one out that has uh, financial highlights for the year at first interim plus program highlights for the year at first interim. So I'll give you a copy of this. And while I'm doing that, Kylie is going to present the first interim report. Yes, and I will try to be quick so you guys can get out of here, but make sure I touch on all the important pieces here. Um, Thank you. I still have my old can one. Can you hold these so I can put them on? Okay, the so um, like we like to remind you every time we present on the budget is uh, we have a 22-month cycle, and this is probably more so for um, Member Pizzotti is to kind of let you know that during, these, during this time, we're getting ready to start our budget development and we are, uh, you know, at budget adoption is at July 1st. So currently right now we're doing the first interim report, which is data through October 31st, as well as our audit report, which we just approved. Um, and then towards the end of the year, we have the second interim report that's data through January 31st, and then we move on to the unaudited actuals, and then the cycle continues again. Uh, currently, right now in this uh, fiscal year, we are working in three fiscal years, finishing up the audit report, uh, just completed the first item report, and then going to be planning for the 16-17 fiscal year for budget development. Uh, we like to also remind you that uh, we want to continue to maintain our positive budget certification. This kind of tells you what exactly the positive, qualified, and negative, but since I've been here, we have been positive. So. Uh, let's continue to do that. <laughs> that must be Scott. Um, some of the budget adjustments that we did at first interim, some of the highlights I want to point out is the educator effectiveness, which is a restricted resource in the general fund. Uh, the allocation was based on the certificated FTE as reported in the CalPADS for the 14-15 fiscal year, So, which is approximately we're receiving... Um, $1,466 uh, per certificated staff. 
Um, the local control funding formula, we are currently using the most up-to-date uh, model that was approved by FICMAT. The unduplicated pupil count just came out. Um, it was a slight increase over the three-year average of the 69.38%. Uh, we just certified our CBEDS enrollment, and we are at 7,538, which was a decline of 38 students from last CBEDS. Um, and uh, the multi-year projection is based on a conservative budgeting practices. This here shows you the local control funding formula that we are currently using with the unduplicated uh, percentage that has changed. So this is the target um, that we will actually obtain over the eight-year period. So we are expected to see this at um, year 2021. Um, so, and again, this is using the, the approved model of the FICMAT calculator. Um, and we show a target of the 70.1 million. This data also shows, I just wanna point out that it has the 1415 P2 ADA, and um, this is even when we do our P2 um, 14 or 15, 16 ADA, with the enrollment declining, we're assuming that we will also be funded at the prior year as the hold harmless. Um, for those of you that like to actually see it as a visual, uh, this breaks it down by the base grant, the percentage of the funding dollar amount, um, the supplemental grant. We have the add-ons, which we don't get the TIG, but we get the transportation, very small piece, as you see. Um, and uh, we have the grade span adjustment with the concentration grant. The entitlement here is just kind of showing you the difference between from when we brought this to you the first time with the 45-day mm -hmm. revise versus the first interim report, the changes of the unduplicated um, percentage that went up very small, um, 6857 did, oh, because this isn't the three-year average, so to the 68.86, and again, holding the ADA at the hold harmless of 7,294. And it shows the adjustment in the entitlement for current year, and it's about, I think, 320000 from what we reported at 45-day revise. Uh, this is kind of a reminder for you just to um, show you that the funding that's absorbed into the LCFF, but the requirement still remains. We have the Williams Act um, that is the current, year, uh, current requirements are the general subject areas of textbook and instructional materials. We have the teacher vacancy or missed assignments and the facility conditions. The deferred maintenance is uh, what we see in it's designated in the components of the ending fund balance and every year we increase it by 250,000. So currently we're at 2 million. Um, and the routine restricted maintenance this is, um, we've got the, um, it looks like the, the prior flexibility was extended out through the June 30th of 2020, and the district currently has a contribution rate of 3%, which meets the state requirement. Uh, in this slide, we are showing the projected ending fund balances for 1516, with the ending fund balance of 14.8 million. The economic uncertainty reserve is the board approved 6.5%. Uh, we also have the deferred maintenance, which is what I was telling you as the two million. And we have the set asides, which are the three there that we've assigned as the 101 devices, the common core and the capital investment. Um, for the multi-year projection, uh, this is uh, based on the Department of Finance projections showing that uh, the current year gap funding um, moves from starting to slow, slow down in the funding growth. Um, and this is also assumed at the best case scenario. This shows you the three years out, um, well, current year and then two years out with the funding increase that we're currently at of the 14.23, and then it shows with the 2.38% and the 1.88% um, and how the entitlement changes. And um, just to kind of to point out that this uh, 
will, uh, sorry. Um, even though years two and three show us that we're deficit spending, we're gonna <coughs> definitely keep an eye on that. And then also I wanna point out that the expenditure exemption does not include the additional salary enhancements. <coughs> Uh, proposition two was voter approved. It's for the public school system stabilization account. This basically puts a cap um, on our reserves if these four conditions are, um, are met. Uh, and fortunately, therefore, the state reserves of the board education remains at the 6.5%. Our next step is uh, beginning of January, uh, we attend the governor's budget pr proposal and make those adjustments in the second interim report and bring those back to you. We're gonna continue to monitor the attendance um, and we're gonna continue to work on the long-term professional development plan with the capital investment plan. And then also uh, doing the joint review of the update of the local control accountability plan with Gwen Dillinger and her team for the LCAP. Is there any questions? I, I do have a um, quick question. Has our enrollment increased this year or has it decreased? In it's the declining. Yeah. By how much? 38. 38. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so when the governor's budget comes out, do you guys go to, say, the Department of Finance at all and talk to them about um, maybe advocating um, for the district or, uh, you know, trying to get any additional money uh, or expressing the concerns that maybe a smaller size school district may have. Do you do, you do that or? No. Most of the, the advocacy that, that we get um, as a school district comes from the Education Coalition. And, and we provide input to them and they'll, they'll ask us how particular things may be going or what some of the struggles we may be having you know, based on, on the district of our size or our particular demographics. But we don't do direct lobbying to the capital. That's done through the Education Coalition. And who's on, on the Education Coalition? Uh, Sorry, I'm new. <laughs> the CSBA, uh, school services, um, uh, AXA, there, there, there's... Uh, a, a very wide group of folks that are part of the Education Coalition. Okay. I, I don't have all of them off the, okay, that's off fine. the cuff, Thanks. sorry. That's good. You can go down to the Capitol. I was <laughs> just going to say, does anybody want to come with me? <laughs> um, one piece I'll say, um, I went and heard a lot about TK and preschool, and I'm a huge fan of early childhood ed, although TK does drive me a little crazy because you're only helping a few months worth of kids. You know, his birthdays fall within a few months, and they're the oldest kids. And um, so it's really hard on the youngest kids that can't qualify for it, I find, when they start kinder. But one way that we could help expand it, it doesn't fix that problem of giving it to everybody, but some places are expanding it a little bit who find declining enrollment in those grades, which I think we're finding, given some of the options that people are looking at, is to expand the window for TK a little bit, but then once they hit their birthday, we get some of that ADA money. And right. so in some places, they're finding that um, that it's financially um, supported decision. So it might be something that we look at or consider thinking about. Yeah, I, I would um, advocate for our district to look at that um, this, this morning. Um, we had a very small, intimate roundtable education discussion with Assemblymember uh, McCarty, and this particular item came up so that we could really see a true alignment of uh, three-year-olds going to preschool, having full access to preschool, and then four-year-olds um, having full access to a TK program, knowing that eventually they're going to be turning five, and instead of starting a student, Let's say a student turn five, turns five years old in January, instead of them waiting until January because that's when the district would receive right. funding, we would um, invest and have the students start the first day of school. And so um, I would advocate that we take a look at what our numbers look like now, what they possibly could be for next year so that we could bring that to the board to see if that might be a way uh, where we could start 
looking uh, because it's almost the side around of getting um, preschool mm -hmm. in um, at the four-year-old level. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. We do have good. a public comment <clears throat> from Don Stoffer. <laughs> Hello again. I've, I've got a couple of questions. Um, on the projection for seabeds where we lost only 38 students, um, I seem to remember last year when you were doing projections for this fiscal year that you were anticipating that number to be higher, like on the order of 150, 160. I can't remember the exact number now. And in addition, do we know what grade levels are being affected by this uh, loss of students? Is it the lower elementary, which is where the enrollment in the charters would be? So that's the question there. Uh, second, on deferred maintenance, is there a best practices number that our district should be setting aside for deferred maintenance? And are we moving up to that number? Or what's that, what's that number based upon? Where did that come from? You know, why are we setting aside more every, every, every fiscal year? And the third thing, is I, I'm wondering why we, again, are, are cutting the Department of Finance uh, estimates for uh, the LCFF in half. And I remember we did that last year, and the language was the same, that the, uh, it was considered that the Department of Finance estimates were a best case. We know that they were actually a base case, that the estimates came in several million dollars more for this district. So yet again, we're doing that again this year. And the latest estimate says that the state budget is running about $3 billion over what was projected in June. So it seems to me that um, I, you know, I'm wondering if there's another, another estimate that might be more realistic that we, the district could rely on. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve P2, approval of the first interim financial report for fiscal 2015-16? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Move to P3, the approval of the first interim 2015-2016 budget transfers. <laughs> and, and quick. Um, now that the first interim report is approved, with the budget adjustments we made for first interim, we have to ask the county to move our budget from adopted or approved to revised with your approval. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? <laughs> <laughs> There's a motion? Yeah. And a second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. We like those. You can do those all the time, Kylie. We are to future board agenda items. We have the board bylaw series 9000 and governance handbook in January 2016. And we have item Q2, the special board meeting that's scheduled for January 9th at the uh, district office. Is there any other future board agenda items we'd like to see? Did, did we move permanently board governance up? We, we had to, to do the governance part. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, my only thing then that I might throw out that we revisit or look at down the road is um, how we use our student board member and possibly um, during certain items maybe be um, asking for more input or there might be times where we have a, an agenda item that, um, that we'd like some input there. So it might be a way to revisit. I know some boards um, use their student board member quite a bit and actually somewhere at CSBA too. So it might be something yeah. to just look at that role and, and how we um, best use, because she's very competent, you know, we have a great resource. She is fantastic. I'd, I'd like to see a resolution supportive um, of the universal preschool measure, the um, County Board of Education is um, is working on, but I'm not sure if we put it on a future board item or it's just a resolution support that's all T talk with Linda okay um, what we will do is when the County Board of Education um, approves their resolution then generally what we'll do is take theirs and then bring Lunch. it to our board meeting okay. upon their the next approval. meeting we'll push it yeah okay it hasn't been no not yet. no just want to 
put that bug in your ear. Yes, sir. I just had a quick comment. Um, since the CSBA was so educational for me, and I'm sure everybody had such a, a great time, um, maybe now, I think this year is in San Francisco coming up. Maybe if we can expand it to some of our assistant superintendents as well, because there were some things that I think could greatly benefit them in terms of, you know, um, just the sheer volume of information being shared from district to district is wonderful. There's also some CSBA that are coming up in January in Sacramento. I think January through March, that they usually come around, so keep your eye out for that. Cool. Very yeah. good. Is there anything else? With that, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Everybody have a nice holiday.